All right, here we go. Michael Jai White, welcome back. Hey, man. Welcome back. Yeah. You were just here a couple of weeks ago when you uh, crashed uh, Fred the Hammer Williamson's interview. This is true. Yep. And now you're back to promote your new movie, The Outlaw Johnny Black, in theaters September 15th. That's right. That's right. While while this is uh, probably while this interview is going on, mm-hmm. you could go see it in the theater. That's Only right. in the theaters. Only. Only in theaters. Not on demand. Not, not, you got to go demand. buy your tickets, get your popcorn, bring yeah. your family. Enjoy it with the culture. That's right. Yes. That's right. And I've, I haven't seen the final film, but I saw an early screening maybe about a year ago or so. Yeah, at my house, right? Yeah, at your yeah. house. Yeah. Right. So I haven't seen the final, final cut, but I have a pretty good idea yeah. about what the movie's about. Yeah. Great film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's way better now because once you got this, the sound and all the music and all that kind of stuff in, that's when you got a movie. And this is the follow-up film to Black Dynamite. Yeah, it's in the same vein. You know, mm-hmm. it's the same folks, kind of, you know, that that kind of a thing. Right. And it's, you know, in the, in the same way that Black Dynamite is sort of a play off the black exploitation films, mm-hmm. this is a play off Western films, including the black Western films that came out during that time. Yeah, you can call it a Westploitation if you want. Westploitation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And the interesting thing about this film right now is that the Screen Actors Guild gave you permission to promote it. So yeah. explain how that happened exactly. Yeah, so with the strike going on, uh-huh. um, you have to apply for something called an interim agreement. Okay. Right, that means you're going to comply with the new laws wherever, it, wherever they land. And also, you can only qualify for that if you are an independent movie. And this is about as independent as you can get because I started you know, out of my own pocket with yeah. funding in this movie. And, you know, we had crowdfunding and we got all private money. And so that's, we totally qualify for that because of the budget uh, level and the fact that we're not connected to some big studio or the uh, AMPTP, which is the the thing that uh, SAG SAG and AFTRA is fighting against. Okay, because you actually are a SAG member. Oh, yeah. And other films you do are SAG films. Yes, sir. But this right here is not considered a SAG film? No, no, it absolutely is. It is. It's got nothing to do do with that. Okay. No, no, no. So, you know, I don't want to get it too complicated, but there's, um, there's, um, there as a conglomerate or whatever that's connected to streaming and these very unfair practices of not even thinking about giving people their residuals, you know, I don't want to get too over, you know, kind of over folks' head, but basically, you know how residuals work. Mm -hmm. Well, for the longest, when when you did work and it played on the the TV or whatever, Mm -hmm. you, you and all the other actors get paid from that. Right. So since streaming hit, all of these streaming services, they're not paying anybody anything. Right. Well, they pay up front. And I think they the pay the producer is, up front. Right. Right. And everybody else is getting residual checks like 50 cents. Well, yeah, I got my uh, Boondocks residual check, uh, which I gave Carl Jones during our interview as a mm-hmm. thank you for putting me on. It was $4.50. Yeah. I said, here you go. And see, what's, what's, <laughs> what's heartbreaking is that there's a lot of people uh, who lived off of residual. Yeah. You know what I mean? So right now, people are kind of, it's like blood money. They're, they're benefiting off of everybody's work. If you, if you worked on something and if somebody's getting all this money and not, it's not trickling down to you anymore because there wasn't any rules in place once that got put together. So now it's just like, hey, enough of that. You know, y'all, y'all got enough money. You got years of money that, you didn't completely deserve. So it was time to share some of that. And you find out they're not trying to do that. I mean, is there a a light at the end of the horizon, at the end of the tunnel, I mean, in terms of, does it look like it's getting worked out? Oh, because there will be. The because striking is still happening as we're filming this as right we now. Speak, I was right? just in New York also, and they were striking in front of like MTV or something. Oh, yeah. and See, the, 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 the trick, the trip is this. I mean, even studios, uh, that want to do the right thing. It's their um, stockholders. Stockholders don't give a damn, right? You see what I'm saying? Because if somebody's your stockholder, 
they're in it just for money. They're not in it for anything else, for the love of it, the art of it, anything like that. So even if a studio wants to do the right thing, stockholders are like, hey, uh, I put money behind this to make money. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So eventually something will have to you know, come to a head because you know, actors, we're, we're not going to do this stuff. We're not going to continue to do this stuff. The way you know, you know the situation, how it is now. Well, but in your case, this is actually your film. Mm -hmm. You funded it, you put it together, you produced it, and you finished it on yep. your own, right? Without mm -hmm. any major studios. Right. Can you know? Can I ask you what the budget was on this film? No, nope, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I had to try. <laughs> had to try. I like pocket watch. I like pocket watch. Okay, yeah, yeah. so you put this thing together on your own. Yeah. And then at the time it was finished, did a distributor like pick it up and partner yeah, with you? Yeah, and with Samuel Goldwyn Company. You know, remember MGM? MGM. Goldwyn is the is that middle part. That's right. the G part. So they, you know, they 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 do independent films. They're you know, they're a distributor. They 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 do that, but they're not part of the that that conglomerate that I spoke about. This is okay. this is still an independent film. This is something that was done with independent money. I mean, isn't it rare for an independent film to be released in theaters? Like, how many theaters are getting released in, by the way? Um, it, the, the number keeps going up. So we we have what you call a platform release, right? So there's like, it'll be like 300, 500, 1,000, that kind of a thing, depending on the response of the audience. Uh, I was part of a movie called um, Pandora's Box, which only had like five theaters, right? At <laughs> okay. first, right? Not 500, yeah, well, five. but But it built up because what it was is, we, you know, it's like when people come out and support that theater, we wound up with an 8,100 per screen average. So then every theater in the country started asking for the movie. And so that's uh, incidentally what gave um, uh, Will Packer his deal over at Screen Gems. Because, hmm. you know, we knew how to get that thing on the road and we went to the people, very much like Tyler Perry. He knew his his audience, and that's 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 the way you do it. You 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 know, if your audience comes out for it, well, you're gonna you're gonna see more movies like that, and that's what I want to happen with Outlaw Johnny Black. I want my audience to come out. If you like Black Dynamite, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what everybody else is saying, not what I'm saying, but everybody's been saying this is better than Black Dynamite. That's them saying it. Okay, I'm I'm a little partial, as you might understand. Right. But um, all the critics, everybody's saying that they love it because there's a, there's a message behind it. You know, it's it's okay. You know, we can laugh and everything else, but I'm, I'm trying to say something in this. And a lot of like independent movies and in studios, you don't get a chance to do that kind of a thing because you know, movies, a lot of movies, they're into trying to make the same damn movie over and over. I, that's not me. I want to make a movie that I want to see. So, how many theaters is it in? It's it's like, it's in, it, you know what, on the way over here, they just hit me with a bunch more. But it was like 300, like, an hour ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then internationally, it's getting released as well? No, no. International is later. Later. But okay. we're, we're, we're doing domestic, and it's, and put it this way, it's in every black town right now. I'll say it like that. If you, if you black, it's, it's, it's in your it's in your Detroit, neighborhood. Detroit, Atlanta. Yeah, man. We, we're, doing a, we're doing a screening at Inglewood over here. We're doing... And so I'm gonna be bouncing around the the, the nice. states. You know, you 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 pack your theater, you might see me. Okay. Yeah. And a very good cast in this. I mean, of course, yourself, who is plays the outlaw Johnny Black, like your shirt says. By the way, you can get merch as yeah, well. Yeah, we we made these shirts. You know, this is part yep. of like what got our money. Uh, Jill Scott is in it. Jill Scott's in it. Uh, Glenn Thurman. Glenn Turman. Turman. Sorry, Glenn yeah, Turman. It's okay. Sorry, Glenn. My bad. No, it's good. It's I made good. sure the screening at, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, at and Michael's house. You don't house. know who Glenn Turman is. Glenn Shame Turman. on you. My bad. Yeah, but but no, no. I mean, you know, yeah. people can mess up the names, but but Glenn Turman, I mean. Tommy Davidson. Yeah, Cooley High. You know, JD's Revenge. Uh, you know, you know, people, I mean, it's, shoot, it's, it goes too long. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, 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 it's also great. married to Aretha Franklin. Was married to Aretha Franklin. Rest yeah. in peace. Yeah. Okay, Tommy Davidson, who I've interviewed before. Tommy. Who's a wild man. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Russell Peters, who is a 
Asian Indian playing an American Indian. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. you know, the, the comedy was not was not missed when I saw that. When I saw him on the screen, I said, "Oh, this dude's playing a, an American Indian." Okay, You're right? Yeah, the Native for the American is the right term. But, yeah, an Indian but the playing the Native Indian, American. Indian, Indian. <laughs> but the funny part is, I remember seeing uh, him do stand up like at some little club in uh, Brooklyn back in the day, and that's what he would say. He'd be like. Red dot, not two, the, not two feathers. Red <laughs> right. dot, not two feathers. <laughs> right. like, you know, see, and you know what's crazy? I knew Russell before he was doing stand-up. Mm, it's okay. Crazy as hell. I was doing a movie in Toronto years ago, and um, he was hanging with a friend of mine. We all, like, you know, went, on my days off, mm -hmm. I was hanging with my boy Drew and this other dude, right? We'd always be, you know, rolling around in the places and stuff, and then cut to years later, I'm at this comedy club. Uh, a friend of mine, Benny, I'm sure you met him, he turned me on to this comedian, Russell Peters. And I'm listening to his tapes or whatever, and I'm watching him and all that kind of stuff. And I become a fan of his. And I go to the comedy store here in LA. And after, you know, um, well, actually, Russell's DJing at the comedy thing. And I go up to him and I'm hey, man, I'm a big fan. He's like, Mike. I'm like, Mike. What? He's like, man, I've been looking for you. And, 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 then he, and then he lets me know, dude, I was the other dude with Drew. So we was traipsing around. I, I, Full circle. I didn't put it together. Full so, circle. Yeah, yep. so that, that, that it kind of came out like that. I was like, yeah, I thought the dude looked a little familiar, but I thought I was tripping. Uh, Michael Collier. Michael Collier. Yep. Collier, who yep. I've interviewed as well. Uh, Randy Couture. From the yes. MMA world? Yep, the, the captain. <laughs> Brought him in. That's a real Captain America right there. Kim Whitley? Kim Whitley, my cousin. Your cousin? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I forgetting? Because it's a big cast. Oh, man, it's, it, it's a whole lot of folks. I don't want to I don't want to tell everybody who pops up. But, you know, y you know who was going to pop up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Samuel L. Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson was on could, his could way to the Could we say Rumble. what he was going to do? Can we say, come on, we, I mean, at this point, okay. it's not going to happen. It's yeah, not okay. going to happen. It's cool. not going to happen. You told me about <laughs> right, this like right. a year ago. But right. it didn't happen. Yeah, it and didn't the happen. final cut is now out, is okay. now finished. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so tell me, on the record, the role that Samuel Jackson agreed to do in this film. Yeah, well, Samuel Jackson agreed to kind of reprise one of his uh, characters. Right. It was going to be this little funny thing that he was, he was down to do. Uh, but, you know, he had to, he just had back surgery. And he wasn't feeling well. And I was like, nah, man, I can't ask you to do that. But we talked about shooting it later if our, you know, if our, uh, if our schedules matched up, but mm -hmm. they, they ended up not matching up. But the, the, the thing was, and I'll let you know right now, exclusively. So I'm, my character, I'm riding and I'm eluding this posse. I duck between these trees. The posse goes by me. And I'm watching him disappear off in the distance. And I'm like, and I start riding back the other way. But as I'm riding, they're riding off in the distance. Here comes Sam Jackson in the same look from Django. Yeah. Come, comes out, stops him and go, there he is right there. So he, he tells on my ass. Snitches on you. Yeah, you know, as, <laughs> as you know, the Django character. As that Django character. Right. That hateful Django character snitches on me. And I'm like, oh, hell no. And then I, you know, I ride off and they, they start chasing me again. But that's what Samuel L. Jackson was going to do for me. Uh, and he agreed to do it. He and agreed to do oh, it too. Oh, man. The, that would have been like. The theater would have exploded. Oh man, yeah, <laughs> that yeah, actually it, happened. It, it would have, it would have, it would have taken people by surprise. But you know, I, you know, it, it's but when it comes down to it, this is this is a movie, and yeah. there's a friendship there that you know, and a respect. Because I mean, you know how I feel about Samuel Jackson. Well, yeah, I, I remember, argue uh, about you yeah. know. Well, since I remember there. in our interview, well, you know, when you stopped in for the Fred Williamson interview, I think Fred made a comment that like. Uh, Samuel Jackson movies don't make that much money. I'm glad you I'm glad you zeroed on in on his face and didn't show my face. I am glad. Right, because after the interview, me and you uh were hanging out and we actually looked up the living actors who have made the most money with their films. Not mm -hmm. not personally, but whose films made the most <laughs> Connected money. To the biggest and Samuel franchises. Jackson was number one. He's number one in the history of film. And so, I mean, I, when when Fred said that, I was just like, Ooh. I was like, I don't, I, I, I couldn't even, I was like, 
Okay, just control your face, control your face. There's a man I respect over here. He he could be wrong, but I was like, oh no. Cause I mean, Samuel Jackson to me is number one in a in a lot of levels. You know, and I, you know, sometimes I, you know, I I mean, I rate him at number one for a lot of reasons. Okay, I'll I'll do this. I'll 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 experiment with y'all and, and you. Yeah. Okay, who's our number one black actor? Denzel, maybe? Okay, now so you say say Denzel. Everybody says Denzel. Okay. Now I want you to imagine something. Not hating on Denzel, because Denzel's the shit. Denzel, and then we're Sam Jackson, somewhere down here. To you? Um I mean Denzel has Oscars. Okay. Samuel does not. Okay, well, let's so, talk about so so that's you know maybe in terms of kind of a purist kind of view mm -hmm. of it. Who's the maybe who you say who's well, the well, better he, actor? You know, he's got more accolades, I suppose. Better actor. Okay, let's let, let's look at that. Okay, so let's think about hmm, recasting Sam Jackson in roles that Denzel played. Let's let's experiment with that. Now, now could Sam Jackson have played in American? Uh, gangster? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Could he have played... Training Day? Training Day? Yeah. You know good and damn well he could yeah. have played in Training Day. That. Right? Could he have played... Well, he couldn't have played Malcolm X. No. Denzel looks more like him. Yeah. Fences? Yeah. Damn right. Uh, glory. Glory. I don't know. I don't. I don't know about that one. Okay. I, I, okay, I, I, okay. I think. I think. I think Denzel was sort of a Denzel was sort of uniquely. Qualified. Okay. Now let now let's reverse it. What roles that Sam Jackson played could Denzel play? Could Denzel play Nick Fury? Mm, maybe. I can see it. Pulp Fiction. You start going down the uh, snakes on the plane. <laughs> well, uh, I, other guys, <coughs> all those, uh, you know, now when you start thinking about Samuel Jackson's work mm -hmm. that nobody else could have played, don't you start doing this a little bit? Well, I actually looked it up. Uh, the top 100 stars in leading roles at the domestic box office. Number one is Samuel Jackson with a domestic box office of five point seven billion. Right, with sixty seven movies. Yeah, so he averages eighty five million a film. Yeah, so so the thing yeah. is, like, Robert what, Downey Jr. is two at so, five point five million with forty four films. Yeah, so when you think about it, when you say best actor, just like most roles that they could play, I I look at Samuel Jackson. He could play. He could play damn near anything. Anything. He plays well, comedy, drama, like uh, Broadway. Like, there's nothing that that guy can't do or hasn't done. Well, but, well okay. But, 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 but to but, be fair, okay, hold on, hold okay, on, hold okay. on. I see where you're going with this. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. to be fair, I wouldn't put him, now this is not a, a black actor, but it is an actor. I wouldn't put him in the same level as a, like a Daniel Day-Lewis. Because, because... I feel when Samuel ja uh, Samuel L. Jackson plays a role, he's always Samuel L. Jackson, pretty much. Whereas Daniel Day Lewis really transforms into a different person in a lot of films. Okay. Whereas Samuel L. Jackson, in the same way that Denzel is kind of always Denzel in a way, Samuel L. Jackson is just always that same type of cool character, even when he's in Star Wars. Right, right. See. I feel like he was kind of still Samuel L. Jackson in Star Wars. Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's my opinion. No, no, I, I ain't arguing with you here, yeah. but but. Like you just said, like you for said, example, like I've never you just seen said, him you, play. You just said Denzel's Denzel all the time, and exactly. Samuel Jackson is Samuel, Samuel Jackson. Jackson. Right. Well, there's one of there's one of those characters who can can just be implemented in such a wide variety of movies, right? They have so many facets to who they are that can play comedy, drunk, and be dangerous, uh, and just kind of just absolutely radiant. You know, I'm I'm you know I'm gushing a little bit on it, but I'm just saying when we just look at it, you know, I'm just saying this, look at it a certain way, right? 
it's kind of like when people uh, are have been around a while. Sometimes we don't give them their flowers hmm. because we have, we've been conditioned yeah. to be like, oh, that's the top dime guy, Denzel, Denzel, Denzel. I'm like, yeah, cool. I I agree with you, but yeah, damn it. <laughs> In, in my mind, Samuel Jackson is the baddest cat out there. I mean, Samuel and, you Jackson. Know, you can talk about you know Daniel Day Lewis, but I'm gonna run you down the whole damn thing too. When did we laugh at Daniel Goddamn Lewis? No, but Daniel when, Day Lewis. But for so, example, I mean, can, for can example, Daniel that? Day Lewis could transform into like a Lincoln. I don't think that Samuel L. Jackson could transform into a totally different person where you yes, forget for you forget name me one movie and listen i'm a samuel l jackson fan i'm just saying name me one film where you forget a samuel l jackson there's several to me but you're not going to agree Would because you, because the, such the, as because the the, the the character he plays in Django is not anything that i've seen of him before okay that's true right that's so true. i mean there's a there's a lot because i've paid attention to samuel l jackson yeah. there's a there's there's you know there are things because i mean he's coach carter he, he he played Samuel L. Jackson could be a, a physicist yeah. and a crackhead. Yeah, he played. Uh, now remember the until Daniel Day Lewis uh, the, shows me that I I you know I'm still going to put Samuel L. Jackson up here. I mean, Unbreakable. He played the villain, like the the, the super villain. Unbreakable. If you start on, you know, just maybe maybe I, I was a little too hard on him. Okay, no, no, I, I mean, mean that, no, no, yeah. but but that's the nature of things. Yeah, because it's how people are branded. You know, it's the conditioning because people just are so used to Samuel L. Jackson because you've seen him a million times. Right. But that's a bad motherfucker. That is the baddest motherfucker out there. In my opinion, I don't see nobody like, even with your Daniel Day-Lewis. Yeah, I'm he's like, tall as hell in person also. I remember I met him on a plane he's once. He's no taller than me. He, he just gotta, looks he, taller. He got to be about 6'3". No, he's not. How tall is he? You Hold could on. find this Hold out. <laughs> he's probably 6'1". I'll give Sam Samuel Jackson six one. He's six two. Okay, he's same height as me. Okay, okay. Right. I remember. You know, usually when I meet actors, they're usually shorter. So when, yeah. you, when I meet a tall actor, it's always like I probably give him an inch or two. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but you know, it's it's the it's the nature of things. Hey, yeah. Buster Rhymes has been around for forever. Yeah, I think that's the baddest dude in hip hop. Yeah, I mean he's dope. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, a lot of people won't, wouldn't think that right off because he's been right there. Yeah. But on all the criteria levels, he is at the top of, if you want to go lyrically, you want to go, you know, vocally, if you want to start yeah. doing all the accol yeah. accolades, I don't think there's anybody who hits all of those points like Buster Rhymes. Yeah, I mean, he even does pop music and jumps back. Yeah, no, I right. feel you. Yeah, but, you know, I feel you. Yeah, but, you know. Well, uh, when Fred Williamson was here, we talked about the term black exploitation. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he was sort of like one of the faces of black exploitation, and I was always confused by that term. Yeah, and he kind of broke it down to me where he felt it was almost like a shot that Hollywood was taking at black actors to try to diminish who they really are and their roles because these movies were making money, uh, you know, audiences were flocking to see them, uh, you know, people made you know good careers and everything else out of that, but it sounds like exploitation like it's a bad mm -hmm. thing and he actually said that NAACP um actually jumped on that term and started to kind of run with it He's just right. to also downgrade what these you know just actors who mm -hmm. happen to be black were doing the word black exploitation came up because we were making money more money than the whites were making my films across the street with drawing crowds, three to hallway, like Caesar was drawing crowds mm -hmm. over across the street. Other films weren't. So it was the terminology created by Hollywood to demise, to make jerk joke out of all the films that had black stars. They created this philosophy. Now, unfortunately, the NAACP grasped it and perpetuated it and kept using it all the time. This is Fred Williams' latest black exploitation movie. And I'm seeing, I'm, I'm talking to them. I said, who the hell's being exploited? Everybody is working. There's more blacks on the screen now than ever. You got blacks starring in films now. I'm not, I'm not exploited. I'm happy with, with the money I'm getting. And so I, don't, I never understood what it really meant. You know, who's being exploited? So fine, I could make a movie now. I'm the only black guy in a movie and they'll call it 
Fred Williamson's latest black exploitation movie. So then I went on and I took an ad out in Variety, back page in the Variety. I said, Fred Williamson is not a black actor. Fred Williamson is an actor. Mm. That created a lot of problems. <laughs> so, but I didn't really care because is 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 Eastwood a white actor? Was John Wayne a white actor? No, John Wayne was an actor. actor. Yeah. You know, why why is it every time I gotta make a movie, I gotta be black actor, I gotta be black exploitation. Make no sense to me. So yeah. as someone who made a whole film about black exploitation, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, black dynamite. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that term? Yeah, I, I, there's a part of me that can't stand that term. Man. Yeah, I bet. But I know, but I know where it just dated from. Uh, it it was created by the NAACP, right? But when they when they created it, it was because of exploitive movies that the first movies that they spoke about that um, when they, when they coined that phrase was when there were movies. Since all of these black movies were making a lot of money, mm -hmm. there were outside movies, like movies from uh, France or you know Italy or whatever, that would be totally French or or you know Italian movies, and they would cast a black person mm -hmm. in a minor role and put that person on the poster for the United States, hmm. and that is where when, when NAACP spoke about black exploitation, that's what they were talking about. And that word just took off. Right, and it encompassed everything. It, well, because there's just a people's attitude with it and everybody wanting to downgrade anything that's black. That shit don't stop. I mean, it's like Black Lives Matter. Everybody wants to find some fault so they can hate on it. Yeah. You know, they want to find some fault and then they put black exploitation and they sprinkled that shit over every black movie at that time. Even movies like Shaft and all these other movies like Super... Like, there was movies like Superfly, Shaft, Three to Heart. Th these movies were studio films. Yeah. Right? And a lot of them occurred before the word even existed. Right. But they got engulfed in that word after the fact. Yeah, everybody. And there's people who hold up the word black exploitation like it's, it's really positive. Right. It's right. got the word exploitation in it. Yeah, it's got the word exploitation in it. And they're like, yeah, I love me some black exploitation. It's like, damn it. Yeah, I know what you mean, but you don't know what you're saying. You know, so th so that's the way I, I can't stand it because it belittles great movie making from black people. You know, and sometimes I got to use that damn word just because it's, I get, you know, to make, have people understand what I'm freaking talking about. So I got to use a dumbass word. I remember uh, when Fred was here, we talked about one of his big films, The Legend of yep. N-Word, Charlie. Charlie. And it's spelled with a hard R. And or everything else Boss. Like yeah. Yeah. N -word. <laughs> yeah. Boss N-Word. Yeah. Right. With, with, with a song to go with it. Okay. I, I missed that part. <laughs> oh, you don't know the song? No, I don't know the song. Oh, everybody pull up the song. Yeah. They call him Boss. Boss N-Word. It goes just like that. It sounds like a jingle. I mean, you're probably too young to have gone to the theaters. Probably not. Well, the, the, the Charlie I'm older than you think. <laughs> I mean, did you go to the theaters to watch these movies? Oh, yeah. Well, it, I I would see the the second runs of them. I didn't know they were second runs. Yeah. But yeah, I was I was in the theater every weekend. Okay. From 13 years old. On. And I talked to Fred uh, Fred Williamson about that title. He goes. I don't give a shit. It was designed for shock value, and and you know we had billboards about it, and the theaters it were. It wasn't so shocking up. back then. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel you. I feel you. But when you look at, for example, these types of titles today, do you, are you okay with it? Do you kind of cringe or the titles today? Well, that title, the legend of yeah. And we're well, Charlie. Yeah, I, I, shoot, I, I created Black Dynamite because I thought shit was funny. Mm. Because I realized one day that I looked back at Willie Dynamite and and uh, you know uh, the Mac and Superfly and realized I had these posters on my wall and I'm going, wait a minute, they were pimps. Yeah, and I was like. What the hell's up with my childhood? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and so I really started laughing about it. 
And then I was like, man, wouldn't it be interesting to do one now to, you know, put the put the light on it, right? And and realize that, man, there was a time when we started coming into our own, right? It's like the pendulum swings. Like we were doing our own movies, and that pendulum swung like crazy. And all of a sudden we're doing movies where we're killing white folks like on the street and walking around with their bodies. And it's like, yeah. And it's like, okay. And 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 I would I, I would watch a lot of black exploitation movies and I would have a dead whitey count. And I'm going, <laughs> this is fucking hilarious. And then it was like kind of like they would just, it's like we haven't had our, our heroes. So we're gonna make, we're gonna make the fantasy of every damn possible like black superstar. That was like everybody had plenty of women, yeah. right? They they basically had clubs, the flyest cars, mm -hmm. killed white people like no no problem. Beat them up. <laughs> just, but like I'm serious. It's like I think Street of Hardway was like something like 67 dead whitey is my wet, dead whitey count. And I'm going Wait, 67 this, white people got killed in Street of Hardway. Right. And, and think about Street of Hardway. No bullshit. That, that was not a comedy. Three the Hard Way was about these three, you got the three baddest black men in action movies doing a movie together. What was the movie about? It was about an evil Dr. Feather who had liters of liquid that he was going to put in the, the water supply of like Chicago, New York, and L.A. And it was going to kill all the black people. Not a comedy. Not a comedy. Not a comedy. Not yeah. a comedy. That shit's funny. Yeah. So that's what I did. So I'm like, wow. Let's, you know, like, it's like when you look back at a, a TV show from the 80s or whatever, and they said, you know, they have something in the year 2010, and there's flying cars. And it's like, y'all kind of overshot that, right? So, but like, Looking back at the movies and, and realizing there was such a time that was, man, that time was amazing, but funny at the same time, because it was like distrust of police and the whole conspiratorial thing that black folks enjoy so much, even to this day, is always the big they, you know? They, they you know, they gonna do this, they go, it's always the they shit, right? You know, so that's to me something you know, to, to make parody about and, and uh, like re-laugh about it, mm -hmm. but on a different level now. I mean, yeah. I mean, before my interview with, with Fred Williamson, I rewatched parts of Three the Hard Way and the, that one Jim Kelly scene mm -hmm. where they try to plant the drugs in his car and he beats up like 30 cops. Yeah. <laughs> like a cop car would show up and he beat up everyone in that car. Another cop car would show up and he beat it everyone. It was a serious <laughs> movie too. <laughs> Going to set me up. And then he, yeah, and that's why, go set me up. Then he goes and he kicks the cop. Yeah. He's got on slippers. <laughs> he went from boots to slippers, like like, right. like sneakers or something. And he's showing in slow motion. Ooh, right? <laughs> and it's like, that shit's hilarious. And all of a sudden, he's got boots back on. <laughs> right? Not I mean, a lot of continuity back then. Right, huh? right. And, and and I remember when the, the theme song came for Three the Hard Way, you know, you know, and there's a there's a shot where they 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 got the car the, in, in the in front view of the car driving, right? But I'm looking in the back and it's holding up traffic like crazy, <laughs> right? And I could tell they they just holding up traffic. <laughs> they probably ain't got no no you know permits permits or yeah. anything. But there's people trying to be like, what the fuck? <laughs> like that. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's like a time that, I don't know, man. It's like, that was, that was revolutionary at the time. And they, like I said, it was serious. And Dr. Feather was going to kill all the black people. Mm -hmm. Right? And give them sickle cell. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Dead serious movie. Yep. Well, after the Black Dynamite movie came the Black Dynamite animated series. Mm. And that lasted, was it two or three seasons? Two seasons. Two seasons. Yeah. 
Now, I had just had Carl Jones over here, mm -hmm. and he felt that the series got canceled after his CNN interview. No. He, he said uh, he went on CNN to do an interview about police brutality and everything else like that, and um, he didn't think anything of it. And he was saying as he was like walking back to his car, there was like a black guy that was working at CNN. He kind of gave him like the black fist <laughs> as he was walking by. And he was like, oh, okay. I didn't think it was that serious. Mm -hmm. And he said the Adult Swim CEO uh, called him afterwards and said, yeah, I think we're going to wind down the film. And he said, the CEO said he felt it was too smart for the audience. We did this season finale um, for season two, right? It, it was called Wizard of Watts. Right. So it was dealing with police brutality. It was a, it was like a 45 minute long special. And because of that, um, I actually got asked to do an interview as on CNN to talk about police brutality, which is crazy. I'm like, why do you want a cartoonist, the animator, you know, what I mean, to speak about this topic? But OK, cool. So um, and it was right at the time. I can't remember because it's, it's, there's so many fucked up incidents that we had with the police. So I can't remember exactly which one it was. It was Mike. I can't remember. But. I, but they but they were showing a lot of footage on CNN about us like breaking into stores and you know what I'm saying and just looking crazy and I remember I went on this whole rant where I was like basically saying that like you know you guys are I was basically saying that we need to control our own media you know what I mean because the way CNN was portraying black people on TV was participating in the social engineering uh, or, or at least the perspective that white America has with black people as seeing them like monsters and not having empathy and these kind of things. Right. And, um, I didn't really think I said anything too crazy. I think the, I think the craziest thing I said was if, uh, if Obama would have looked like Sam Jackson, he would have never got elected. <laughs> and I, I think I went on this whole thing about like, I don't know. It was, it was, a, it was a, you know, I was on one. So I, I left there and I was, I remember I was walking um, to the car and it was a guy that worked at CNN. It was a black guy. He walked past me like this. And I was just like, <laughs> I was like, oh, what, what? I'm like, oh, that must have said, I must have really said some shit. I, I didn't really think about it at the time. And then I got home and I got a call from the network. And uh, Mike Lazaro was like, yeah, that's not the kind of attention that we, uh, that we, we want <laughs> for this network. And, you know, then he went on to say, like, he, he he loves Black Dynamite, right? But he said the second season, <laughs> I think we just went a little too, we, we went we went crazy on the second season. Like, we, you know, we, we we had like, you know, like Honky Kong and it became a white exploitation and a black exploitation show. Like, we were really, we were really going in. And and so, like, he he basically was just saying that it's too, in his words, he said, it's, it's probably a, a little, I probably shouldn't say it, but he's a little too smart for the audience. You know, because he said, you know, he's like, we got a lot of it's a lot of smokers and weed heads, and you know, what I'm saying like they, you know, he was like, they want to see stuff that's a little, little sillier and, and crazier or whatever. So he was like, I still, we still want to work with you. So if you got anything else, you know, we definitely want to do do more with you. But like this one is just not it. That's what Carl said. You know, said that they wanted more, just kind of like more regular comedy you know how, when you you guys were really going hard with it with honky kong and <laughs> some of these other kind of you know interesting types care type of characters are you disagreeing with what happened yes I did. okay so it was your film i mean it was your series mm -hmm. what do you think happened because i love the series i watched every episode yeah they've asked they've asked us to bring it back i mean it's it's the ratings are always amazing yeah what 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 literally happened First of all, it wasn't a cheap series to do, you know. I bet, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was animated in Korea. It was, it's, it was a, it's a lot of things that were going on, and it wound up to be the only half-hour cartoon series on a cartoon network. Huh. All the other ones were like, you know, fifteen minutes. Oh, which okay. would translate to eleven that. minutes, right? Okay, and then for commercial time and stuff. So it became expensive for them to do. So that was one thing. Unless you want to believe that they, they stopped it, you know, <laughs> they did that because they saw him give a po black power salute to or have a, yeah, you know what? Okay, yeah, you know, it's, it's there's gonna be endless they shit, but no, I, I don't, I don't think uh, this brother's interview is powerful enough for somebody to be like they, you know, of course they're gonna be what, what's Carl Jones doing, you know. 
and, you know, twisting their mustaches <laughs> and be like, with know, cat what did cat. he say? <laughs> no, I, I disagree. I mean, he's, he's got the right to believe what he wants to and think that an interview caused the demise of the show. But no, nah, I, I disagree. I mean, were you disappointed when the show didn't get renewed? No. Why? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a lot, a lot of expectations. Mm. And, you know, my thing is, I, you know, I do my best in what, you know, I don't, I just don't look in the, in the I, I just don't kind of do that, man. Like, I move on. Okay. So you're like, on to the next project. Yeah, yeah, okay. man. I, I absolutely move on. I mean, because it was a very different type of animated series. How many people got killed <laughs> in this cartoon because usually people don't, don't die in animated series yeah. like <laughs> I, I don't know people I, are constantly I, getting killed throughout black dynamite yeah well i, I tell you because th that was more uh you know i had um influence in it but ultimately as carl jones you know as an animator it's a whole different kind of skill set there hmm. so it's and like my thing was i'm more live action stuff and what my specific kind of thing is sometimes doesn't translate to cartoon. Um, and, you know, so, but what his skill set, he can, like if we're talking about Black Dynamite putting the foot up somebody's ass, he literally can draw that. Right. Right. And so I can't tell if that's going to be funny or not mm. because he's going to animate it or, He's gonna, like something can happen, and then the look of Black Dynamite's face provides the comedy. Well, how's he gonna draw the face? I can't even fathom that. I can't even control that. So it's no matter what the story is, it's kind of like there's a visual that I have no control over, mm. right? But some of the stuff I wanted to, I wanted to highbrow the humor a bit more, because sometimes, well, and a lot of his writers, they were younger. They're not from the era. And I wanted to be a lot more uh, authentic to the 70s. And there were a lot of 80s references and 90s references, you know, kind of waffling through. So it was hard for me to kind of get behind that. But I, I would happen to know, and myself, and myself and Byron would happen to know equivalent references that we could have pulled from the 70s. But you know, it's it was hard for the writers who didn't experience that. It's hard for them to really grasp it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of that, one of the things that that Carl Jones also mentioned was that he initially had a a problem with the Cleveland Show, which is a show that's written by white people, voiced by white people, played playing black characters essentially. Mm -hmm. I know zero about that. I've never seen like one minute of that show. Never watched one minute. No, I watch bits and pieces. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, do you feel that Hollywood needs to have black characters playing, you know, black actors playing black characters in animated films and stuff like that? Or do you think it doesn't really matter? It doesn't really matter as much as it might to some. Uh, I think in that scenario, to be politically correct, I think, because, I mean, it's not like we're thriving and we're, we, there's so much work for black entertainers. So in that way, I don't think anybody should feel completely right with that. Uh, I do, there is a part of me that feels like if, I mean, this, there's a, with the Cleveland show, it's not cut and dry with me because if this person played it, in the original show, well, if you didn't have a problem with him playing in the original show, why have a problem with him playing now the lead? You know what I'm saying? Well, I think in the original show, he was somewhat of a minor character, and maybe it, it got under people's radar. You yeah, see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, now, yeah, suddenly, yeah. you Absolutely. have a whole show on, uh, what was it, on Fox? or I, I forgot what network it was no, on. No, I, I don't know. Again, I, I've never seen it. But I just know it's a it's a spinoff character from Family, Family Guy. Guy. Yeah, exactly. Which so, is a major show. Yeah, so it's like, damn, if you didn't have a problem with him doing that, well, then 
He said, I can argue where this, this, this guy has been doing this role and why should he be penalized? So that, that is a, you know, odd thing there. I would, I would, I would hope that it would counterbalance in other ways. Well, remember the, uh, like, for example, on The Simpsons, the Apu character, the, mm -hmm. you know, which was an Indian character, I think was played by a white guy. And people were upset over, Hank over that. Er, uh, Hank, how do you say Ariza? Hank Ariza, Ariza, I'm sorry, butchering the guy's name. He's a great actor. Yeah. I mean, and, and Hollywood is sort of notorious for this type of thing. Like, remember uh, West Side Story? They had a whole bunch of white people playing, like, Puerto Ricans. And they just like kind of painted their faces brown. Yeah, you can keep going with Cleopatra and all that other shit right. too. And you know, Moses and Jesus. Right. Keep on. <laughs> Doesn't stop, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just very ongoing. I think that yeah. this is, you know, I mean, I guess you'd call it digital blackface or or, or something of that sort, if you really want to get extreme with it. Um, I, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, and it goes on. Like people feel that you shouldn't have a straight character playing a gay character. See, in, that's in, where I, you know, I, you know, right there is where I say, no, that's too much. So that's too much. Yeah, that's, that's too much. I mean, you know, it's like, I mean, gay characters have been playing straight for, for a long time. Mm. Yeah, I that's think, true. <laughs> I, yeah, the other way around, you're right. Yeah, yeah man, because it's, it's like, come on. <laughs> Rock come Hudson. On. Yeah, yeah. Rock Hudson like, was a ladies' a, man. It's about you find out beings, he was gay. Man. Yeah, it's kind of like, like that. That's where I'm like, stop, you know, stop. There's, it's like it's the pendulum shit. Yeah, it's the pendulum shit. You know, like with the whole woke thing, whatever. There's people who benefited finally and got their due. All right, God bless them. I'm so glad for the woke shit. But then, of course, anything you do, just like I was talking about the pendulum with the with black exploitation era of the, because I can't fucking use another word. You know what I mean? Um, that where we're, you know, we're showing our independence and whatever ends up with killing like umpteen white, white people for nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's the pendulum. And hopefully it swings back in a, in a, in a decent area. So yeah, there's going to be, when you, when you're, getting justice for somebody, right? It keep that pendulum starts and so I don't want to I don't want to hate on it, but I understand the overcorrection. And it's just we're overcorrecting now. You know with this yeah. whole thing, oh you got to be really gay to play gay and you got to be straight to play straight. <laughs> Come on, stop it. Nah, now yeah. we, we this is a human a human being. So it's like if I'm playing a boxer, I got a box. You know what I mean? It's come on, it's it's getting ridiculous. Yeah, I remember uh, Ben Kingsley got a lot of grief for playing Gandhi. I mean, he's actually half Indian, but he looks more white. But mm. they they you know, but he had to kind of color himself brown to play Gandhi, and some people were upset about it. But I mean, he killed that role. I think the onus should be on how well you do it. There you go. And if you if you half ass do it, then you know you you, you deserve you getting your ass kicked. And drag, okay, right? not physically. You know, I'm, ta <laughs> right. I'm talking about you know uh, cri critically. But but if my thing is, oh, you're a straight guy, you gonna play a gay, gay character? You better do it justice, right? You know, that's the thing. Don't don't step into something and half-ass it. You gotta respect the culture that you're playing. Let me ask you a question. Do you think in 2023 they could have put out Tropic Thunder with Robert Downey Jr. Playing a black character. It's a comedy. Yes. I hope they do that. You hope I they do hope that. I hope they do that. Again. What if they announce like Black Panther 3 starring Robert Downey Jr.? That's not a comedy. <laughs> that shit ain't funny. That shit ain't funny. Right, right. Okay. So, so I mean, it's a comedy. Imagine the outrage if like that the, actually happens. The happened. thing that drives me crazy, people are, are going out of their way to be outraged. Yeah. Pendulum shit. Okay. It's like, oh. I get to correct this shit that should have been corrected for fucking decades, a hundred years, that gets corrected. Oh, now the overcorrection happens. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's, that's just the nature of human beings, man. Somebody's gonna benefit and then it's just gonna be like, let's keep going. You know, it's and to, to, where, to where it's ridiculous now. Well, I mean, I think to your, to your point, 
Robert Downey Jr. played it so well in Tropic Thunder, but he was like, what do you mean, you people? Mm-hmm. And in the back, he was like, what do you mean, you people? <laughs> like, right, right. There, was, there was so many of these like moments, yeah. you know, in it that was just so funny because it was a white character who's playing a black character, you know, but the whole time he, he was staying in character, even though they're not really acting during the, the course of the movie. Yeah, man. And I remember when it came out, no one I knew that was black had a problem with it. Like I didn't hear a single person say that's racist. They should, they need to fucking cancel that movie. You would hear it now because everybody is it's on woke. that shit. It's on that woke shit. Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's like, again, now, now the word woke is a bad word. Yeah. Because of the overcorrect. Exactly. It didn't you know used to I mean? be. Yeah. It meant yeah. that you were actually educated and you, you know, you actually dug into things a little bit. Now it's exactly. like it's used by the by the right as a as an insult. Yeah, yeah, because that's what they want yeah. it to be. And it works. They, and so they just need an excuse to take a positive word, something that meant a lot and did great for people, and turn it again. You you gotta ask, well, why is the desire there? Why you you can't wait to turn that word against against folks Mm -hmm. so we can dispel anything that you stood for. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like Black Lives Matter. Give me a reason. Give me a reason to hate on that. Oh, oh, they did something wrong. Oh, and they're gonna you know, they're gonna harp on that. It's just human nature. They've been doing that forever. You know, Martin Luther King. There was some janky. He did something wrong. Let's let's make that the narrative. No, but to be fair. BLM, BLM did some janky shit in terms of the management. I don't in, in care. Terms of the management. I, yeah, I'm just saying. And, and the, the, I'm just saying. Yeah, but the, buying themselves a whole bunch of multi million dollar homes. And that's with, what with, Black with, Lives with, Matter means then. Well, that's what I think that organization is now is now like basically branded as. Now the whole movement at Black Lives Matter, I don't think people think of that as in general. But I'm saying that that particular group, I think, was kind of janky. And in fact, and, and, from what I understand, like you know. They're now in debt and stuff like that. So, you know, paying your brother a million dollars to do security and stuff like that. I mean, look. The actions of how many people? See what I'm saying? Well, See, but, but the leadership. The, thing, thing, the, thing, the thing. leadership of that organization. Listen, I mean, I, I, I st- don't even, listen, when it, when it was down, when, when, when the George mm-hmm. Floyd thing was happening, we looked, you know, we were going to donate to some organization and we decided that the best organization for us to donate to was the NAACP. Mm-hmm. They'd been around for whatever 50, 60 years. So it was calling it, you know, since they were calling it colored people. Yeah. Exactly. Was the, yeah. They still call it that. That's, yes, still, I, yeah. that's the CP part. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> exactly. But I felt, you know, I mean, like we got together and we felt that this was actually a legitimate organization. It's been around for a long time. You could see historically what they've done. And mm-hmm. we felt that was the best place to, to donate to. Um, other people are like, oh, why didn't you donate to BLM? Why didn't you donate to this? It's like, well, this is the organization that we felt was the most, you know, legitimate organization, the most established organization. But at the end of the day, mm-hmm. listen, it, it is what it is. And, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I see you and I don't agree on this, but no, nope. it's all nope. good. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's still because, because if, because the overarching thing is if there's a reason for people to feel black lives don't matter, and there's there was some scapegoating of and 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 making people feel that now is justified that their hatred or them shooting down that organization and I mean nobody's gonna search for a reason to uh, exonerate that you know because when you just go you just think it's like th- they can't wait for anything that they're not in control of uh, to fail. It's the it's the, the desire you are on, you, there's a target on your head as soon as you step up and say, I'm trying to do the right thing for underprivileged people. There's, there's this constant desire to shoot your ass down. Well, like I said, I think the term and I think the overall idea of it is still very important. I just think that some of the people in leadership position of the organization, including the founder who ended up quitting with mm-hmm. a, you know, a huge multi-million dollar real estate portfolio, which she, she did not have yeah. before, before all the donation money came in. 
I just think takes away from it. To a of certain course, degree. of course. That's but, all I but, feel. But, but if but, you, but if I, you I want don't to notice it's... the Black Panther at every time you think of anything, and what is what is the movie? The movie. NAACP. What do they say about that well, organization? Listen, listen. Nothing. Listen, listen. Because it's a legitimate organization. Uh, I've heard so many things against NAA. Do you do you understand that NAACP has had a target on them since they started? There's always been this this type of thing. Um, and even the movie that Out Outlaw Johnny Black is based off of, I, I based this movie off of Greenwood, which was Tulsa, right? And you and I know you might have heard of the- uh, The Tulsa Massacre. Yeah, the Tulsa Massacre. Yeah. You know, Black Wall Street. And so many towns like Tulsa, Rosewood being another one, mm -hmm. but this story has happened so many times. And it's indicative of the mindset that if black people are starting to thrive or have something positive, there is this desire to eradicate that. And all they want is an excuse. I, I turn, turn the excuse into a bit of comedy that, you know, commentary in the movie, but on a very real level, it's interesting that the majority of these things have started with the same rumor of white women being raped or desired by black men mm -hmm. and would justify the Klan coming in and burning down an entire black town. Very much like what happened to Emmett Till. Emmett Till, yeah. Yeah. But if you, you investigate this history, this is something that has occurred some of, like it's been over a hundred massacres, right? And I dare bring this up and offer a bit of something to think about in um, in regards to uh, redemption and dare I say forgiveness and moving on and you know, shedding the shackles and, you know, uh, moving on without your hatred and uh, prospering. You know, we know, you know, there's things that's, that's, that's happened. But one thing I, 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 I personally, you know, I, I always say I, I don't like someone enough to hate them. Because you're going to ask me to hold this poison in my heart that's going to limit my my moving forward you don't hit anyone no i i and i, I try not to i don't like people enough to hate them cuz why am i going to give them that power if i don't like you i'm not going to let you occupy any space in here i don't like you fuck you you don't hate George Zimmerman? I would love to beat the shit out of that dude. Right. I don't hate him. You know? But it's like, imagine me walking around, like, angry at that. I'm like... Okay, you're talking about... I'm angry at the thugs in, the, in, the, in, the, in his community. I'm like, y'all ain't doing your job. <laughs> There's a part of me that's kind of, like, petty like that. Right. But, but um, nah, man. George Zimmerman don't mean enough to me for me. <laughs> to me carry any negativity in my heart, like I laugh about it to some degree. I mean, I you know, uh, um, I mean, I'm, I don't laugh about the incident. You know, I damn sure wouldn't laugh about it. I don't know how I'd be if I met that dude. Think you might punch George Zimmerman if he walked by you in a mall? I can't. I can't promise you. <laughs> <laughs> it might happen. Hey, you know, Tr <laughs> Tracy's a friend of mine. That you know, that's um Tracy Morgan? No, 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 um Trayvon's dad. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh so you know, we spent some time together. Mm. But um Yeah, I, I met him and his mom before. I mean, if I was the old me, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, like the the guy that didn't get rehabilitated or whatever, I don't know. I I probably want to plot something, but that's that's not that's <laughs> that's the other, that's the old you know, that was that's the, the old Michael Jackson. That's the old me. Got it. Mm. <laughs> 
Well, before we get off the topic, once again, the outlaw Johnny Black in mm. theaters, September 15th. Uh, watch it. Great film. I've seen an early cut of it. And if it's anything like what I've seen, you have a great, great movie experience up ahead for you. Well, thank, man, I'm, 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 I don't fall in love with my own stuff, mm. right? You know, it's just like raising a child. You do your best and you let that child go. Yep. And hopefully the world loves your child. There you go. And so here's a situation where, you know, when people are are talking, and you know, the 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 first audience of actually my first screening, one of the producers left and called me the next day and said, after I saw your movie, I called my mom and I hadn't spoken to her in eight years. Wow. And because of your movie, I called and and resurrected issues with my mom and we're getting together. Love it. Love I was it. like, yo, that's the shit. I did something right. Now, if I could do that for other people, man, that, that means the world to me. Mm. And so what's happening is people are coming out saying that they got something out of this. And it's cool because they weren't expecting it. You know what I'm saying? So, man, see, I grew up loving these movies that Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte did. Uptown Saturday Night, and Piece of the Action, things like that. I mean, man, those movies I grew up with, man. And, and, and you can watch them with your whole family and, and you just, you're uplifted. You're proud to be black, right? I wanted to give that experience to this generation. And I want the generation, of my generation and older, to relive it. Kind of like you did with Black Dynamite. But also, there's a generation of people who love Westerns. I didn't just write this for the black audience, even though it's a, you know, it's a story that's you know, based off of Greenwood, you know? Um, but I, I, I do this for, for everybody, but concentrating it um, in a story that's of you know, downtrodden folks that has a historic history to it. But yeah, man, so I'm really loving what the critics are saying and, uh, and the fact that, you know, it's, people are surprised. There you have it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's switch gears for a second. There's a big fight coming up. Tyson Fury versus Francis Ngannou. Mm. Now, he's actually coming from the MMA side yeah. into the boxing ring. How do you think this is going to end up? Oh, I hate to say it out loud, man, because Francis is my man. But, but no, man. <laughs> you think Tyson Fury's gonna, gonna, I gonna think tap him up, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's Tyson Fury has footwork. He's a tall man with footwork. That's hard to beat. <laughs> there was a man named Muhammad Ali who was a tall man with footwork. You know how hard it is to hit a guy like that? Yeah, I actually looked it up. Uh, Tyson Fury's six foot nine. Yes. Woo. And if you have to punch up, it is very hard to have power up there, okay? Tyson will probably try to let the uh, few rounds you know, go. I think he's a really nice guy, and he's a showman. He's <laughs> a nice guy. Yeah, because, I mean, it's the footwork thing. I don't see, uh, boy, and if, Francis gets tense at all. Yeah, because I looked it up. Francis is six foot four. Mm -hmm. He's not a short man by any stretch of the no, imagination. He's, a, he's, he's taller a than me. Freaking tree, man. Right, but yeah. there's still five inches between the two. And a and a long reach advantage. Oh right, yeah. His arms, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah, was, Fury's arms are like orangutan arms. Like it's crazy. Yeah, Fury has been doing this since he was a child. Ah <laughs> oh, man, you know. Uh. It's I, I, I get your money, Francis. <laughs> I, I ain't hating. No, I mean, because no. um, this is this is at the end. It it is a it is a happy end. It is a it is a triumphant story. Because what where he left with, with with the UFC, and to see him, you know, making this kind of money, wonderful. I mean, have they run out of heavyweights? for this, something like this to happen, to have to go into MMA and pull someone out? No, man, dude, I think you got, 
<laughs> you got the the Paul brothers to thank for this. Yes. I, I said I was applauding what they were doing from day one. What people want to see, you know, cutting through the red tape, you know. So, you know, it is what it is, man. It's it's spectacle, and you know, somebody can hate on it, but you're going to tune in. Yeah, and I mean. Tyson Fury is such an anomaly because he's just not built like a professional athlete, and yet he is one of the top professional athletes in the sport. Yeah, you know it, it frustrates me. I, 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 I always think. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a uh, boxing nerd. I, I don't understand why heavyweights don't don't step up technique wise. A lot of heavyweights still stand there and slug. You know, kind of toe to toe, and when you you have people like Ali and and Holmes, and you know, with with movement, at at a you know at a in a bigger frame, but then it, it, what came along is these these athletes that were big mm -hmm. that used their size to their advantage and would tie people up, yeah, like the Klitschko's and you know. Um, Lennox Lewis still, you know, he still had skills. Couldn't go backward very well. But um, I mean, isn't Evander Holyfield kind of sort of in the middle of that? Someone who's very athletic, very well, built, but also has a lot of technical ability. Well, yeah, Holyfield was basically a cruiserweight. Yeah, that, yeah, that bulk. Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. And he had to, you know, he had to, he had to bust ass to to do something in heavyweight. You know, he man, talk about a heart, man. That dude had more heart than three people put together. But he had to work hard. He had to work hard, you know. But um, but yeah, man. See, you know. But the, I'm talking about the the really big heavyweights. We've come up with like two decades of just people just not putting in work. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the excitement in boxing is no longer in the heavyweight division, and it hasn't been in a long time. And when you think about boxing, it's known for the heavyweight division. That's really what people look for because that's yeah. where the knockouts happen. Yeah. You know, it's very rare that you see a heavyweight champion get a get a decision. Usually, they take the belt off the guy's back. Yeah, and it's very rare to see a heavyweight match that you don't fall asleep on. <laughs> Not a whole lot of personality out there, and that's a that's a big component. A lot of big guys, if they're athlete athletes, they're going toward football. They're doing something, you know, without getting their brains be then just I, I i think i think that that era of the big athletic boxer who just wants to win and just smother you and whatever i think that killed boxing mm. well uh logan paul is coming back to boxing uh against dylan dennis mm. i'm not very familiar with dylan dennis are you no okay well, apparently they're they're going at it on social media where uh Dylan actually posted a video of Logan's fiance, which I guess was hacked off her Snapchat about her wanting dick and stuff like that, to the point where she had to file a restraining order and file a lawsuit against him. Um you know, it's it's a weird kind of situation. But what's your take on Logan Paul as a boxer? Like number one, who's the better boxer, Jake or Logan? I don't know. Huh. I, I would have said, uh, man, I don't know. You know, uh, uh, you know, I visited Logan on occasion. Um, but I think, I don't know, maybe because Jake has been more consistent, I guess I would give the edge to Jake now, and he damn sure has power. So that's the great equalizer there. You know, because no matter what, <laughs> Jake is dangerous. Yeah. Jake is dangerous. Yeah. I mean, Logan fought uh, Mayweather, but the, the weight class was crazy. Yeah. I mean, the weight difference, I should say, was crazy. And yeah, he, still, yeah. he still lost. And But you predicted this. Oh, yeah. 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 And, you know, I mean, th th you've never seen a spectacle like that with a weight difference like right. that. That's, that's just crazy. Yeah. I mean... I don't think Mayweather's going to do any more real boxing matches. I think he's just going to do these kind of money grabs, you know, as he gets older. Uh, I don't 
see him really. I mean, I think the last. I think the last fight that may have been dangerous for him was McGregor, and even that he handled pretty easily. Yeah, it, it, it did have a yeah, a bit of danger in there because the guy was so much bigger. Right. Yeah. And younger. Mm -hmm. And probably stronger. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, but he wasn't a boxer. Right. You know, we were all waiting for him to, like, start losing and kick Mayweather in the face or something. Like, <laughs> but that didn't happen. I mean, he took his lumps and he mm -hmm. lost. And he even said that uh, Mayweather was able to stay calm in a way that he's never seen before. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he was getting frustrated or whatever, and Mayweather just stuck to the plan and oh, yeah. did what he did and, and won round after round after round and won mm -hmm. the match, got his money, went home and... Yeah, well, bought a new house. <laughs> yeah, Floyd. The thing is that people don't realize. I mean, Floyd to me is just the smartest boxer I think I've ever met. Oh yeah, I remember in one of our interviews, you were like, "I would never want to be a boxer," and I'm like, "What about Floyd Mayweather?" You're like, yeah, mm, I was like, "Yeah, uh, never mind." <laughs> yeah, because let me get off that. Uh, yeah, let people, me get off that hill there. <laughs> people don't. People don't realize. Like, okay, look at the intellect of the person in the ring. Listen to the way they speak, the synapses. How how quick is it? Yeah. You know, that's who people are fighting. You see how Floyd Floyd is like he's so, all there, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And so it's like that's who you're fighting. That guy can strategize in the middle of the the, the round, like you know, way better than the person that is like, yeah, I'm gonna fight Floyd. You know, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like if so, I'm not saying it's it's like yeah, it's. It's not a, you can't separate the personality from the fighter. That's one in one in the same, you know what I mean? Yeah, because Floyd's never really taken any damage in right. the ring. In fact, he's never even been knocked down. Now there's a Zab Judah thing. Now Zab will claim that he knocked Floyd down, but ultimately it was ruled in the ring that it wasn't a knockdown. Yeah, but, but yeah. that's probably as bad as it got. For Floyd, oh, Floyd. I, I would say the the worst would be uh, um, uh, Shane. Sure, Shane Mosley. Yeah, uh, okay. uh, Shane stung him. Okay, him pretty bad. That that was the worst I've seen Floyd. But even with that, he didn't come out a bloody mess. No, he <laughs> he turned and beat the hell out of Shane. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You don't see him, you know, coming out looking like. Uh, you know, some of the bad George Foreman fights. Right. Where, where he's, this guy is just like unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Like he he managed to really, I mean, number one, he's in a lighter division, so he's not taking as much physical damage, period. Mm, that, you, you disagree on this? Well, I mean, there's so many. You know how many hits that a lighter weight person takes to the head? It's like, of course, in heavyweights, it's less... Yeah. Hits that, well, but it's heavy. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah, it's, yeah. yeah and the human hits. skull is pretty much exactly. You know, the skulls are kind of more similar than than you might think. Exactly, you know? it's all yeah. bone. Yeah, yeah. I interviewed uh, Alan Dershowitz, mm -hmm. who represented Mike Tyson mm -hmm. uh, for his appeal, and what he said was, in the process of the appeal, Mike was locked up during this time. He said that Mike ran out of money, mm -hmm. and he continued to represent him even though he couldn't pay him at the time. And after he got out. And got his payday, he paid him back. Well, I guess Mike Tyson had actually run out of money. Uh, I continued while... to defend him without money. Um, I continued to defend him. He paid me some money, and then he couldn't pay. But I have to tell you about Mike. The day he fought his first fight after he left prison, he paid me and all the other lawyers, even some who didn't continue with him. I continued with him because I never drop a case. Because my client runs out of money, I feel that I have an ethical obligation to continue the case as long as the client can't afford it. The client refuses to pay. That's one thing. But if he, can, if he can't afford it, I, 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 I continue on the case. I've done that in numerous cases. Mike Tyson being broke is crazy to me because he was making hundreds of millions. I mean, in fact, I remember when we interviewed him, he was kind of describing how at, the, at his height... He was making way more money than all his contemporaries mm -hmm. in right. Hollywood. He was making more money than like the Eddie Murphys and, and mm -hmm. the big, huge Hollywood actors and the big, you know, like the princes and everyone else like that. He was yeah, making yeah. more money than these guys. Oh, yeah. 
I just had a lot of money back. I had more money than anybody in our community had. Even if we entertained, I had more money than them. Yeah. So um, it, I never had money before. So it, uh, that's what you do when you never had money. You buy, you buy a lot of goodies for you and your friends that never had money. Which is crazy, only to lose it all and not be able to pay his lawyer. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't have a cool lawyer, he would have been like, hey, buddy, you're on your own. If you can't pay me, I mm -hmm. got to go, go to a client. But Dershowitz was like, he never does that. He's like, if the client can't pay, he'll continue through the whole process. And yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. Mike Tyson going broke in prison after a few years. We're not talking about after 30 years. I'm talking about after a few years. Hmm. You burn through hundreds of millions of dollars. It's yeah, but crazy you know, when me. you when you have money and you have power, you become more of who you are, right? Nothing's to stop you. Mm -hmm. So this this man was super generous to people who cared about. Overly generous, absolutely. So you're just being more of who you are. I know. I know people who might bought houses for. In all kinds well, you of stuff, because it wasn't, it wasn't about the money so Hold much. on. You know someone that has I'm a I'm not house. going to say any names. No, it's okay. You don't, you don't <laughs> okay, have to tell right. me. No, it's all right. We'll talk, right, yeah. we'll talk off camera. <laughs> okay. You know? I'll, I'll, yeah, get, yeah. I'll get the real scoop yeah, off yeah. camera, and I won't <laughs> mention it again. But you personally know someone who has a oh, house that Mike Tyson oh, just gifted yeah. to them. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot. Man, I know a lot of people. There's a lot of people. Well, I mean, Ed Lover give, give cars to him. Yeah, well, Ed Lover yeah. had a Bentley that Mike Tyson gave him. Yeah, see, that's what I'm saying. And this is the real story. And in fact, and think about it. Do you understand? There's houses that cost less than a damn than a Bentley. Bentley. No, that's true. No, I mean, right. I remember in the story, Ed Lover told it. He said they were hanging out, and Mike Tyson's like, "Here, to take the car." Right. And he took it, and it was just sitting in his driveway for weeks. And then one of Mike Tyson's managers called. And said, hey, Mike wants his car back. He's like, okay, cool. You know, mm -hmm. come over, have it back. He said, when he ran into Mike a while later, he goes, oh, I gave the car back to your manager. Mike was like, no, that guy's a crook. I wanted you to have that car. I gave mm -hmm. you that car. Yeah. Mike goes to send his man in to pay. I'm outside. I'm like, yo, Mike, good time, man. It's getting late. What, yo, got to take me back to New York. Let me get the car out the garage. Mike's like, no, nah, I, can't, I, I can't go back to New York. I got a lot of shit to do tomorrow, Ed. I got to go right to where I'm going. I'm like, well, Mike, have one of your mans or somebody take me in a different car just so I go get my car, man. I got to get my car. Nah, we, I need everybody with me. And he goes, don't your moms live around here somewhere? I'm like, yeah, she don't live too far from here. And he throws me the keys to the Bentley. I take the Bentley back to my mom's block in Queens. I park it on the street. I hit it. Boop, boop. I start walking in the house. Then I'm thinking, hold on. You can't leave this car outside on the street, bro. You got to put it in the garage, but we ain't had no garage. My pops tore it down, so I pulled it into the backyard. Long story short, week go by, I still got this car. Two weeks go by, I still got the car. Three weeks go by, my boys are gassing me out. You gotta move this, man. You gotta, you can't just let it sit there. The motor sees up. I don't know nothing about no Bentley. So I'm driving this shit around the hood like it's my car now. I, I had already <laughs> gone and got my car, but I left the Bentley at my mom's house. Cause I, I, where I lived there in Jersey, you couldn't take it over there either at the time. So I'm rolling. I got this Bentley all of a sudden, my pager go off, 911, 911 with a number. See, that's pager days. I call back, go, yo, hey, Ed, this is John Horn. You know, Mike's, I said, yeah, John, I know who you are. Yo, by any chance, do you happen to have one of Mike's cars? I go, yeah, I got that Bentley where we was out the other night. Yeah, I got that. He said, well, give me an address. I'm going to send somebody to come get it. I didn't think none of it. I knew it wasn't my shit. So they came and got the car. Gone. Fast forward 15 years later, I'm in Vegas at Tau. I see Mike come in. He's standing by the bar. Of course, I got to go holler at him. That's my man. I'm talking to Mike. People come up by, hey, champ, how you doing, man? How you doing? Good. How you? Hey, Ed Lover, what's up, bro? Mike goes, Ed, it's been a good life, right? I'm like, yeah, Mike, it's crazy. He said, people still call me champ. Man, I ain't been in the ring in over 10 years. People still call me champ. Yeah, it's been a long time since you're on TV Rats. People still know you. They know everything. So, man, remember we used to go out to Nels and shit, have a good time and all that. I said, remember that spot we went to? In Queens with the Jamaican bitches, I was like, yeah. So remember that night I gave you the Bentley to take to your mom's house? I was like, yeah, I remember that. He said, you know, I gave you that car, right? I said, what? <laughs> he said, no, nah, I gave it to you. you. I wanted you to have that. You was my man, you know. And I know you couldn't afford a Bentley or nothing like that. So I like having all my friends, you know, be fly. I just not just really want you to have that. He said, John and them came and got that. These jealous motherfuckers, right? I was like, yep. I said, you tell John Horn if I see him, nigga, you owe me 400000 <laughs> all right? Because this nigga gave me a Bentley and you came and got it. 
I didn't know it was mine. I, I said, why you ain't tell me? Like, yo, you know, I was getting high, and I remember I gave her a lot of cars out. <laughs> like, this nigga. Crazy. Gave me this shit. And he was dead serious. Yeah. <laughs> Mike Tyson doesn't, you know, whatever you want to say about him, he tells the truth all the time, it seems. You know what I'm saying? Like, like he's he's... He doesn't have to brag about how much money he made or how mm. much money he gave up. You know, he's had hundred million, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, man. You got that kind of money, you can be you. You could be you. Yeah, and, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, people expose themselves to who they are as well. Yeah. Some pe people in your camp. Well, Alan Dershowitz, in our interview, he also said something else, which uh, I know that you don't fully agree with, is he said that based on all his research during that case... He said that Mike Tyson was 100% innocent. And he said that in the first case when Mike Tyson was found guilty, there were four people, there were four witnesses that said that they saw Tyson with that girl, hugged up, kissing, hugging, everything else like that before they went to the hotel room. But those four witnesses weren't allowed in the trial because he felt the judge had something against him. I didn't, I didn't hear that interview. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't have any <laughs> any claim on any of that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, do you feel that Mike Tyson was railroaded or do you think he deserved to be in jail? I don't know. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know what, uh, you know, that's something I haven't even thought about in forever. Right. Because you played Mike Tyson. Yeah. And uh, that part of his story was played out in the film, right? In the series. Was it, it was a film, my bad. It was a film on Showtime, was it? No, it was on, it was, it was on HBO. HBO, my bad. Yeah, I'm just, I can't even remember what the hell, what we covered in, in that whole thing. But I know it wasn't anything, I didn't have to delve into the court case at all. Oh, you did? It. No, it's, okay. I had nothing to do with it. Like, well, he was in jail for that case when the movie came out, right? Right, yeah. So the end of the movie, I believe the end of the movie um, Tyson is going to the hotel. Okay, so there you go. So it gets covered somewhat, but it doesn't say no, so what to, happens either way. Yeah, you know, if we did a movie called The Trial of Mike Tyson, I might have <laughs> something to say. Yeah. You know, I'm like, fair enough. I don't know anything. Like, like, I only know one little piece of it. So, okay. yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Jake Ball versus uh, Nate Diaz. Mm -hmm. Jake won by unanimous uh, decision. Uh, that's what I figured. So you were not surprised that this happened? No. I mean, Nate Diaz is a is a legend in MMA. In a, yeah. How were his boxing skills based on what you saw? I didn't see the fight. Oh, you didn't see the fight? Didn't see it. Okay. But I, you know, I found out about it, and I, I'm like, shit, you know, uh, Jake hits hard. Okay. I didn't see the fight. I, I, I figured, you know, Nate is smaller. Um could probably get mowed up. I had no idea. But He's I, also older. Yeah. Was he in his 40s, right? I don't know. I, I really don't. Let's look it up. Sounds right. 38, my bad. Mm -hmm. He's 38, so maybe he was mm. maybe 37 when, when the fight Yeah, you know, there's but place if you're limited to boxing, <laughs> in a fight, forget it. Forget it. I mean, like, Nate, you know, Nate would have probably guillotined him, like, quick. But... No, and but boxing, you know, you got you got these pillows on your hand. Well, I mean, are there any MMA fighters that you think will be world champion boxers? Like Bones, for example. Do you think that if you put him in a boxing ring, he would dominate? No. No. C certain people he would. But not. I mean, is he a heavyweight? But he's a heavyweight yeah, now yeah. In, in MMA. So, okay, so John Bones Jones. Versus Tyson Fury. No, 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 no. <laughs> It'd be a train wreck. No, no, that would be, that, no, that wouldn't be good for you. Why? Jones. Why would you say that? Because, because the man has been Tyson Fury's been doing it since he was a child. It's unfair. It's unfair. But it'd be unfair for John Jones to fight him in a in an MMA match. It, that would be very. That would be over very fast. Very fast. I can't imagine Tyson Fury in an MMA match. That that would be. <laughs> I, you know, hopefully he doesn't imagine himself in that too. <laughs> That'd because, be comical. Yeah. Because Jones is what I talk about, like with 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 Mayweather. 
Look at Jones is smart as shit. Yeah. That dude is so wise, calm, and calculated. He's probably his his fighting, you know, his, his fighting intelligence. The first time I ever saw Jones, I was like, nobody's beating that dude. The first time before anybody, I was like, I looked at the way he would choose his weapons, and it was so calm. And his acceleration was such at a relaxed place. The thing, the thing that I always tried to get students to do, he naturally did it. And there are people that from the East Coast called me and said, do you have something to do with him? Because there was something, there's a certain way of moving that he did, which is one of the reasons that I always wanted to train with him. Because I'm like, you know, I think some of it is like he, he's gifted, you know, but but his strongest weapon is here. Well, uh, allegedly, there was supposed to be an MMA fight between Jake Paul and Nate Diaz. You heard about this? Uh, no, I, I didn't hear that. They've been going back and forth on social media. That'll be a fast fight. So, so Jake said that Nate Diaz ducked a $10 million MMA fight. He said, we're at the drawing board right now. Nate Diaz ducked the $10 million offer, so he's not the badass that everyone thinks he was. I wanted to fight him in Definitely. MMA and do something that no boxer has ever really done, which is, in the prime of their career, go over to MMA. MMA fighters have gone over to boxing, but I want to go over to MMA, and Nate Diaz ducked the offer. I can't imagine. So I, Nate I, actually responded. I, I would love to be wrong about <laughs> Let somebody step into MMA who hasn't done it for 10 years. <laughs> That's disrespect. And and that that, to me, is... I mean, you did see what happened to uh, Ray Mercer and folks like, uh, uh, you know, um, James Tony, right? I actually missed those. What James happened? Tony fought Randy Couture. Okay. Just, it was, it was a slaughter. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, because Nate actually responded. He said, here's your MMA fight, bitch. You're easy as fuck. We can box or fight MMA at Real Fight INC. No problem. Fuck PFL and fuck you, pussy. What would you have done in a real fight? Jumped on me and get fucked up, bitch. You don't know what's up in a real war zone. You lost in boxing match anyway, pussy. Fight Couldn't yourself, lame you do this in Nate's, Nate's voice? That would have been so much funnier. <laughs> 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 I was imagining that in Nate's voice and it's like, I, just, I mean, I love this character, man. Yeah, I mean, mm. I mean, he did lose, though. I mean, I guess Nate is trying to say that he won that match, but uh, no, no, no. Yeah, you know, again, I didn't watch it, and I, I feel like I'm not gonna get that time back. I feel like I knew what the hell was gonna happen. Okay, well, but speaking of matches that were a little weird, uh, Devin Haney versus Vasily Lomachenko. We got. Let's get set to argue. Okay, because if you check that out, um. And I was a little close to that because if you ever looked at the, you know, the uh, documentary on the Lomachenko versus Devin Haney, okay, uh, you might recognize the voice of the narrator. Oh, you narrated it. Yeah. Aha. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. And, and, so I'm talking to an expert right now. Right. And I was ringside. And you were ringside. Yeah. So you saw the whole thing. Saw the whole thing. People were very upset. People were very upset. Devin uh, Haney won it clearly. Boosie said that boxing is rigged. Uh, Nelly was so pissed that he said he's done watching the sport. Uh, I mean, Bernard Hopkins said that there needs to be like a like some sort of like okay. state let, oversight let, and everything let me, else like let, that. Let me draw this line. I don't care if anybody hates it or not, but but indulge me on this, and I want everybody to look at this mm -hmm. and you know call me wrong. If I, I don't mind if I'm wrong, because then I learned something. But I was at that damn fight. Okay. And this is what happens all the time. And you could look at historically this. When a bigger man, Devin Haney, hits a smaller man, don't nobody say shit in the crowd because that's expected. Mm -hmm. A bigger guy going, Phew. nobody cheers for that. When a smaller guy hits a bigger guy, ha! Okay. Now, watch that fight. Devin Haney is going, Right? Mm -hmm. Lomachenko, ba 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 ba! <sighs> if you show the highlights of the fight, I swear on everything, 
You are never going to see a piece of anything that Devin Haney did because that shit is not exciting. It's not exciting. But he hit him 20 times to five exciting times. So you are seeing the smaller dude do some slick shit, duck, duck, boom, boom, and that shit is fire. I'm the, that shit is fire. But, uh, you know, he does that, and then it's like, Lomachenko's getting hit, body, and I'm going, yeah, this is exciting for Lomachenko fans, but he's not winning this fight. And so, look, historically, it's always been that way. Okay, I see where like, you're going with this. Look, look at Canelo Alvarez versus Triple G. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Same thing. Okay. Not, you know, no, nobody gives a shit about the bigger guy hitting the smaller guy and how many times he did. But if you start adding, you're going to look at a... You're going to add a bunch of boring ass uh, punches from Devin Haney compared to half the blows of exciting ass Lomachenko. And I understand that you would want the exciting guy to win. Right. But I'm sorry. There's something called points. <laughs> and I know, I, you know, I would have like... You know, it's like, it's just, it's just the way it is. Right. And you say that based on that, Haney got more points, which is why he won. He got more points. Decision. It's not exciting. It's not exciting. Not exciting. I, well, you know, like I, Mayweather I, fights aren't exciting, but he always wins on the points. Uh, I think they're exciting because I, 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 the skill level in slipping punches to me is exciting as shit. Okay. But for you the know? average person watching, Mayweather has relatively boring fights. There's I can rarely see. any any knockdowns. There's really never knockouts, and he always wins on the points. Yeah, no, you, you, well, you're talking about the last um, salvo of of his fights. I mean, he's fought everybody, and yeah, he, he fought everybody. And he, he destroyed he beat everybody. The, the most dangerous people. He the most dangerous people Floyd fought. He clowned them. Right, but he didn't knock them out. Is what I'm saying. No, but he wasn't. It was going to be hard to knock out. Uh, Canelo Alvarez. Right, but he made him run into the uh, into the corner. Oh my God! <laughs> that, I that, that I watched that thing over and over. <laughs> Where he and ran then, into and, like the corner and of the, the ring. And the thing, like, the yeah. thing about you know everybody was always talking about Pacquiao. Stop. The Canelo fight was more Stop. exciting. Stop. See yeah. what what happened is Pacquiao wasn't going to get knocked out. He didn't want to get knocked out. Mm -hmm. So you see him as like a Tasmanian devil, you know, doing all that. He put. He wasn't doing that with Floyd because he knows Floyd was like, come, come on, get some of this. <laughs> and he's backing up, backing up. And, and he knows that he comes and he runs into something with the bigger man being Floyd. He's going to be laid the hell out just like, you know, it's going to be a repeat of, of uh, Marquez. Mm -hmm. So people were trying to say Floyd was running. No, it was, it was Pacquiao that wasn't fighting because if he, if he wanted to just you know, abandon everything and just go winging at him. He could have, but he knew better. Right. So basically, you agree with the judges on this that Haney beat uh, Lomachenko. I would, I would, I would challenge everybody to look at the fight again, and maybe there's something that they could learn from it. It's, it's, it's. I'm so. I get, I get what they're saying. I uh, and I empathize. You don't want the boring fighter to win, but you're not paying attention. To the big, nobody pays attention to that. Mm. Like when, 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 uh, uh, like when Rick Bow is fighting Holyfield. You think anybody's cheering Rick Bow for it landing on Holyfield? Not one cheer. You just don't do that. Mm. We just naturally do bigger. not, we don't celebrate the big guy hitting the little guy. We never do. Okay. You know, it, only, only with, um, Ali, cause he, people don't realize he's always, Usually the bigger guy in the ring. Well, he wasn't bigger than Foreman. Four pounds different. Really? Four pounds different. But it just, just but, but for whatever reason, he was presented as the bigger guy. Yeah, see, it's narrative things. Okay. Four pounds. See, that's why George Foreman is fighting a guy that's his size. Look at their legs. Ali's legs are bigger than Foreman's. Uh -huh. What's more important? The legs. Okay, so the upper body on Foreman was bigger. Yeah, he's just he's just a thicker guy. Yeah. But guess what? The way the way in is the day before. On fight day, 
Nobody knows who was heavy. <laughs> right. Four pounds ain't <laughs> shit to a heavyweight. <laughs> right. One guy's 214, well, no, the other guy's 218. Yeah, it's like 1% difference. Exactly. Yeah. So what ha what's happening is Foreman is swinging on a dude his size. <laughs> He's running into a Mack truck. And it did work out. Yeah, so, yeah. so when you got a guy your size that's moving faster, who has the advantage? Crawford versus Spence Jr. They're saying there's supposed to be a rematch. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, I had some inside information. And okay. a good friend of mine who trains with, with uh, Spence mm -hmm. and was with Spence like a month beforehand is, you know, pro Spence. He told me, nah, Mike. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, you don't have it. I was like, what are you talking about? No, he said, Spence is not a shade of what he was. Huh. And this is before the fight. This is a while. He's like, I wish Spence would not take this fight. He's not ready. Really? Been in the ring with all that. And I was like, really? And then when I saw Spence Crawford, I'm like, oh, shoot. He don't look like Spence. And then after that fight, I realized he really is not there. His legs weren't there. There was so much that was, I'm a big fan of uh, Spence and I followed. And you know, he's had those accidents he's had. And so in sparring and the things that my friend saw that, you know, made, you know, he told me like a month before, he said he shouldn't fight. And then you start putting it together and you go, hmm, think about this logically. Has Bud Crawford looked that dominant against anybody? And to do that with Errol Spence, not to try to take things away from Crawford, because, you know, Crawford's amazing. But I think if you start putting it together and you go, well, yeah, I mean, he... I, I, a lot of people were trying to go like, all right, yeah, they knew, like they knew Crawford was going to do that to him. I don't think anybody knew that. I, I don't think anybody knew that. But Spence does not even seem like himself. And after that fight, it's not because of the damage he took during the fight. There is a difference, a, a big difference. Again, it sounds like I'm taking away stuff from, from Bud, Bud Crawford, but so be it. I, I believe Spence and I believe my friend that, um, that something is quite different. Nobody's seen, I mean, you know, nobody's seen Spence like that, even in the, as they first started fighting. Elon Musk versus Mark Zuckerberg, MMA fight. <laughs> that was supposed to happen in the, uh, in the Coliseum, right? In Rome? Really? <laughs> That's what they were saying at one point. You know what I think happened from my point of view was that uh, it might have actually happened, but then they showed the picture of Mark Zuckerberg with his shirt off when he was all ripped up. I think Elon was like, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want a piece of that. I'm going to get embarrassed <laughs> internationally. Wow. I, you know, I, I heard something, but I didn't know if that was real. No, I mean, they were talking about it, and Zuckerberg was like, whenever you want to do it. Anytime. Because <laughs> I guess he has a whole like octagon in his backyard and he like trains on a regular basis. Well, he can. Yeah, he's Zuckerberg. <laughs> right. He can build whatever he wants. Yeah. <laughs> he can build a stadium in his backyard, mm -hmm. I guess. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would love to see it. I would love to see that. Two major CEOs duking it out. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that's interesting. Mm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know much about, but um, it's Elon Musk that he's... Elon Musk versus the CEO of Tesla, and I guess Twitter, or the owner of Twitter. And what's it for? I don't know, charity. Okay. It's well, not like well, either well, one of them needs great. money. These are like the top five richest people on the planet. So yeah. no amount of money will make any difference in any of their lives. Right, right. right. So yeah, they're going to give it away to charity of some sort. But Lovely. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I hope it happens. Yeah, me too. I don't think it's ever going to happen, though. <laughs>
Elon Musk is a little flabby. Have you ever seen what Zuckerberg looks like without a shirt on? Yeah, of course, I have. I have a picture of him on my wall. On your wall, right? Hold on. Which one is he? Oh, this is uh, Zuckerberg. the one in the middle. Yeah. With Israel, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, okay. He got in shape. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, he's between two killers. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Okay, yeah, it looks I, like... I, I think Elon saw this picture and said, ah, never mind. I would have thought you were showing me three uh, three MMA guys. That's right what now. I'm saying. Yeah. He, he's built like an MMA fighter. So Zuckerberg started doing jujitsu and MMA uh, right at the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown. Okay, good for him. So about four, yeah. three, four years. Nice, nice. Took it seriously, got in shape. <laughs> that's cool. Training right? with some of the top, as that's you can great. see. That's great. I mean, that, that, I think people should take take a page out of his book. That's a that's great balancing. Yeah, you know that that's that's what life is. You should strive for absolute balance. You know, you got you know you got your expertise on this level. Then, I mean, that's great for him. Well, well, I remember you had posted a picture on your Twitter that uh, you were actually Oprah's bodyguard at one point. Oh, yeah, yeah. I bodyguarded her on a couple of occasions. Uh, back in college. Right. Uh, you were how old at the time? I think I was about 19. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you said you had just won a national fighting title and was hired uh, for, to be your personal security. Or yeah. No, the years later, I'd be working for her again. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. That's actually how I met you was, um, you probably don't even remember it, but uh, Oprah's network had like a little media day for some of the upcoming shows. Mm. And you and um, it, it, was, it was a female actress who you were co-star. Tasha with. Smith, maybe? Tasha Smith. Yeah. There we go. You and Tasha Smith had a show coming up, and mm -hmm. I did an interview with both of you at the same time. Well, you know, my, my issues with hip hop is it really is aimed toward the children, Ch children who are you know, sometimes uh, they're at their most impressionable age, and you know. And whereas me, for an adult, an adult, I know where to, where to use it. You know, I I work out to it. I I I'm not you know consumed by it. But sometimes it might influence a child who would pick up a book to try to look like a gangster or just try to you know kind of like I don't know, just kind of leads them another another direction. That's actually how we met. I remember I was asking you about uh because you had just done the Nicki Minaj uh, music video. Okay. Yeah, like the samurai in that. In yeah. Office. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And Lil X uh, directed that. Okay. Yeah. Director X is the name that. Uh, okay. He yeah, wants to go by now. Okay. Lil X, I guess, is not a. Oh well, he was Lil cool X enough. at the time. He was Lil X at the time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What was Oprah like back then? Great. Cool as hell. Yeah. I never forget, man, when I first met her, like, cause, like, when uh, she was coming to the college, you know, in New Haven, Connecticut, and then, and I had won the championship, and they said, well, can can you help out? We're you know, going to uh, condense on, you know, uh, police coverage and everything else. If you could be with her. I was like, well, great. And I went to meet her at a private airport. And as soon as she stepped off the plane with her assistant, um, a, guy, a guy named uh, John Rizzo, Rizzi, Rizzi, passed away, uh, rest in peace. But she stepped off and she had these pearl, pearl sneakers. Hmm. And... As soon as she stepped off, I, my, my, my eyes just looked directly at the sneakers. And I was like, and my face, I couldn't hide. I was like, they were like, I'm like what the hell? I looked at them like, that, they didn't look too cool. And she was like, you're looking at my sneakers, huh? <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, 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 it, they, oh, yeah, yeah, they're kind of different. Yeah, it's like, you don't like them. I was like, oh, well, they're, they're different. She's like, oh, it's like that. And so immediately, <laughs> it felt like I already knew her. And... And we were just cool as hell. And she was just so down to earth. And they, the, um, the, the college uh, booked a, an entire floor of a hotel for her, right? But she wanted to stay at her friend's Gail, Gail's house with Gail and her husband at the time. Guy who was a cop who was studying uh, to get his law degree. Small house. We took her, you know, to the, I took her to the house. And she basically said, you can have the hotel, you know? <laughs> and my ass went out clubbing and I basically got a whole, I invited the club back to the hotel. Back to the hotel. 
Yeah. Why wouldn't you though? Yeah. Seriously, if you got a whole hotel whole, at your a disposal, whole floor of a hotel, a whole floor. Yeah, sorry, a whole floor of a hotel at your disposal. Why would you not invite the club back? That's why would you not? That's exactly what I did. <laughs> you know, and she's like, I'm like, okay, because I'm supposed to take her to the hotel, right? Right. But she's like, oh, I'm, I'm staying uh, with her friend in Middletown. Like, you know, it's Gail. You know, at the time, mm-hmm. Gail was just like it was a long ass time ago. So Gail was basically a newscaster at the time, I believe. Because I knew who she was, and she was a Connecticut newscaster. But yeah, man, she was just so down to earth, man. It's just so cool. I just felt like you know I knew her all the time, you know, from back then. So it was, it was, that was that was memorable. Yeah, I actually met Oprah that day that I did the interview with you. Okay, for the first and only time. I remember she was getting uh, macaroni and cheese with me because mm-hmm. <laughs> they had catering. Yeah, had the best macaroni and cheese I ever had. Oh yeah. <laughs> Her and Tyler, man, for some, man, they, they have the best cooks. Oh. Some of the best. Uh, Tyler, my goodness, some of his parties had some. He had this lobster macaroni and cheese. <laughs> it was the, you still talk about it today, huh? It was the truth. There wasn't that nothing good. like that. There was really? nothing like that. In fact, when I when I was getting married, uh, I'm like Tyler, who who was this? Who who did that? Yeah, you know. But I mean, I ended up having the ceremony in uh, in Thailand, so I didn't I wound up not getting that person? Mm. Oh well. Yeah. <laughs> how how do we get on this subject? Yo, you you with the macaroni? Yeah. The, oh, yeah, bro. man. Whew. Yeah, no, it was. I, I still remember this macaroni. I was actually gonna gonna call back. To the like the office and see where she got that macaroni. Yeah, I wonder that if it's was the same person. Ago, so. It's it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in our last interview, you made some comments about Tupac that mm. uh, people are upset over. Uh, you said that he was, <laughs> if you look at his old right, like, right. high school interview, yeah. he was somewhat effeminate. I said, dare I say effeminate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, remember, I imagine people were going to because I thought I thought you had the ability to show the clip. The you know the the oh yeah no I don't yeah it's since you know, explaining copyright that, copyright that. issues so yeah exactly but people can but, look it up but, it was a very common is that clip yeah but if somebody want to hate they're not going to look it up first yeah. so it's just like if you look at the interview the the whole point is I mean like, here we are we're talking about the human condition we're talking about imagery we're talking about that I find that interesting so when I mean I find it still to this day just infinitely interesting that. The person that did that interview did the role within two years that painted him as a completely different, but convincingly different person, you know? And so it's just like, look at that and make it, make up your mind for yourself. And from even interviews that I've seen here, the consistent thing that people always say is that, well, there was, you know, there's a dichotomy. Like, like he, sh- he, like that. There was a, there was a Tupac who was not gangsterish in certain mm-hmm. scenario, mm-hmm. and so that's that's basically what I'm saying. It's like a lot of there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, and of course he's a he's a hero to, to a lot of people. But I look at the tragic part of that as well, because I happen to know that when there are young people trying to develop to develop who they are, and when they're very impressionable, they are dissuaded and persuaded by gangster culture that they lock into, right? And they will rather go toward picking up a gun than picking up a book. This is real. And for my parents out there, and just anybody in general, I go, okay, of course, Tupac, that you might see in that interview, there have been people who absolutely influence him. Mm -hmm. To be that way. And 
my my thought and several people's thought is that's not who the man was. Well, you know, it's interesting. I remember I talked to someone that was close to the whole, mm-hmm. you know, intimately close to Tupac for a very long time. And they were telling me something interesting because at first, Pac didn't know who his dad was because his mom wouldn't tell him, mm-hmm. right? And that whole story behind his dad is is kind of a real clusterfuck to begin with because Afidi was married to this guy in the Black Panthers. As she's going through her trial, one of the drivers assigned to her from the Panthers, she started to sleep with him during the course of the trial, mm-hmm. you know, with her thinking she's probably going to go to prison forever, like whatever, fuck it. She ends up getting pregnant by him when she gets, you know, when she beats the case, she tells her husband that it's not his baby. So her husband leaves her. She has the baby. The husband dies, gets killed in some sort of crazy situation. So then she ends up getting with her ex-husband's brother, Matulu Shakur. Right. And this is where the whole Mopreem Shakur situation mm-hmm. happens, right? Then Matulu gets caught with the whole like killing of a of a police situation. He goes to prison, which you know he recently got out and passed away. But the point of this, at that time, Pac still didn't really know who his real dad was. And if you ever watch the movie, um, there was this whole part of the movie where Afini was in a relationship with this like street hustler in Harlem was played by D. Ray Davis. Did mm-hmm. you ever see the movie? Mm-mm. Okay. So anyway, so she was hooked up with this, like, with this street guy, right? And he kind of was like a father figure to Pac. And the whole thing about it, the way I had it described to me, was that they kind of knew that wasn't his real dad, but they ran with the idea that that was his dad because they all liked the idea of Pac's dad was this hustler. You see what I'm saying? And Pac mm-hmm. kind of clung to that. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, my dad, you know, my dad was a hustler and I'm from the streets and stuff like that. When the reality is, you know, the dad was really a Black Panther who's a truck driver who really had a whole family, you mm-hmm. know, of his own and he had cheated mm-hmm. on him. And that's how Pac came around. Mm-hmm. But they, the story sounded better that the dad was the hustler yeah. as opposed to the truck driver. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. that's, I think, part of the DNA of Tupac of let's create these sort of things that look really great on paper. And I could, you know, talk about them in my music and I could play this sort of figure, but not all of it is always true. See what I'm saying? I think the majority of these things are not true. Hmm. Right. Uh, A lot of, it's just the nature of folks is that, I mean, you may be an artist, you may have this, this talent and you, you can reinvent yourself. Uh, that's a natural actor's type of thing. It's a natural performer type of thing. Mm-hmm. If we look back, there's a lot of people who presented themselves one way and we find out what's really, you know, what they're really like. I mean, you know, of course everybody would think that, you know, Snoop Dogg was a stole cold gangster at the beginning, but it'd be silly to think that now. Yeah. Because, you know, he's presented who he is. And, um, and, and not not that he doesn't understand the lifestyle or whatever, but you know, but it, you wouldn't think that he's some gangster, gun-toting, hidden, you know, pistol-whipping type of people that you might have thought when, when in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Neither would you think that about Ice Cube and so many other people that you probably have a different assigned image of when they first started. Well, just l- just look at it. I'm like, I just go, okay, the person that. In the interviews of Tupac when he was, you know, two years earlier, what do you, what do you think? He was making that up? There's no reason for him to make that up. And that clearly was not a street person. I mean, if it if it messes with your imagery and your hero, what grow the fuck up. <laughs> grow the fuck up and know that it's, it's human nature. And, and, you know, and put that in your cap and go, oh, Interesting. You know what I mean? Because we're all human. That's what connects us all. And, you know, so, yeah, yeah, people, you know, people are always going to be presenting images that 
they want you to think. It's it's nonstop. It's it's entertainment. It's yeah. Hollywood. It's music. It, it's it's a it's designed to be a facade. Yes. Listen, if you saw what all these people really look like in real life with gray hair and before they got veneers, and yeah, before they like got I, their I, hair I, transplants I know, and their about, lipo and their plastic surgery. I talked about and, uh, and, uh, I talked about Ice T. And his image first coming out. And that's the that's one of the funniest human beings I think I've ever met. Really? That guy's fucking one of the funniest guys. I've been around Ice T before. I can see that. Okay. If he lets you see it, yeah. If he lets you see it, that dude, his stories are freaking hilarious. And he he clowns himself. He is ho but that's not part of his persona. That's not what what he sell. I mean, he made most of his money playing cop. When he yeah. had songs like Cop Killer. Exactly. <laughs> Before that happened. I'm just saying. Exactly. I'm just saying. Yo, you know? I think I might have told you one time. I too, like one of my funniest things that's in Black Dynamite, I got from Ice T. Which part is that? One of the funniest lines is when I go, I threw that shit before I walked in the room. I was imitating a story that Ice T told me mm. about, he said it was a, a, a all out melee fight and he was hiding under a table when everybody was fighting and he stepped out and ran into somebody, hit him and it got good to him. And he was like, oh shoot, then he said, man, I, it got good to me, and I just jumped on a table like like the Riddler. Ha! <laughs> he did like this. <laughs> and then he says, somebody knocked the table over. It was such a funny story. But the ha thing is exactly what I did in Black Dynamite. It was so funny to me that I jumped out, and when I before I say, you know, I, I, threw, that sh I threw that shit before I walked in the room, Imitated, straight imitated Ice T. That, that that guy is hilarious. But again, the whole point is, there's presentations mm -hmm. all over this industry, and it's part of what it is. It's entertainment, and if you don't realize that that could possibly be uh, that Tupac could possibly be not the person he's presenting, grow the fuck up. It's always interesting to me how you have people in entertainment that when they can no longer match that image that people have in their head, they just kind of go into hiding. Like, mm. for example, like me and Foxy Brown were DMing each other at one point, mm. and uh, she got mad at me about something. And she's like, well, you got to take that down or else we won't do the interview. I looked it up. I'm like, Foxy, you haven't done an interview in 15 years. Mm. <laughs> okay. I don't think we were actually going to do an interview. And she's yeah. like, suck my dick. And then she blocked me. But I'm just saying. Like, <laughs> you got that part. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, it's, you know, why else would Foxy Brown not be doing interviews or doing shows or doing whatever for 15 years? Because clearly she has a following. Clearly she has hit songs. And, you know, her and little Kim were like, the two hottest females, you know, mm -hmm. in rap for a while. But my guess is she probably doesn't look like the Foxy Brown that we remember. So she's just not presenting herself out there to the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? She may, may not want to have a whole bunch of plastic surgery to try to appease that part. She has a baby. She's probably happy mm, being, so. being, a, being, you know, yeah. a middle-aged woman and being a mom. Yeah, you I, know hope, what I'm saying? I hopes people, I mean, because when people are keep chasing that high of fame, when people who don't know your ass is making you change your your world to, to just to appease them, it can take your ass out. Like, come on. I believe Tupac did something and behaved at it, what he thought would uh, in a gangster manner that none of the gangsters would even have done, and that's part of what took it take take took him out. Now, if anybody doesn't want to deal with the truth, you're going to pay for it some kind of way. Yeah. If you want to delude yourself and, you know, say, well, I'm not going to do an interview for X, Y, and Z when the real reason is some kind of insecurity mm -hmm. or anything, anybody who runs from the truth, you're going to pay for it. I feel like, I mean, it's 
it's the nucleus of everybody's pain that I know of is if they're not dealing with a reality. You know, somebody says something about you, maybe you need to think about, well, what if they're right? You right. Know? And remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> me, you, and your wife were having lunch <laughs> at a Jamaican restaurant uh -huh. not too far from here. Right. right. And then you ran into a guy that was somehow affiliated with Tupac. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he had like some book that he had mm -hmm. written that was somehow Tupac related. And with me sitting right there at the table. But of course, my face isn't out there. Right, so yeah, yeah. not everyone knows what I look like. Yeah. Right. And you were like, you know, have you ever thought about doing an interview with Vlad TV? And what did the guy say? He said, Vlad's the police. He, he's the feds. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "People, I, people always go to jail for it." Yeah, every, people always go to jail. I remember, man, but, and, and me and your uh, wife were looking at each other, like trying to control our laughter. Like we were right. just like, "Oh, like he has no idea that I'm sitting right here right. at the table as he's like trashing me to you." Right. Yeah. yeah. Everyone goes to jail, and I'm not really trying to go to jail. So yeah, I don't really feel like doing this. Yeah, they actually reached out to me, and what's funny is that no one ever reached out to him. Like, right. Right. <laughs> Like that never even yeah, happened. Yeah, but yeah. It was like, yeah, they reached out to you, but I keep turning it down. But people uh, want to believe the shit that's prison. in their head <laughs> because it makes them comfortable. Yeah. It makes them comfortable. But I'm like, God, you know, that's that's going to keep you so far away from your prosperity and, and clarity and, and happiness. Uh -huh. But you keep deluding yourself. Like I got friends doing life in prison, right? There's a certain part of their delusion that I accept. Because on the phone or whatever, they're going to say, yeah, you know, I'm going to be out soon. Yeah, getting out soon. I'm like, yep. That that's the only time I'm going, like, I hear you. You know, I'm looking forward to that. Because, you know, that's make, that makes you move on to the next well, day. You need hope in prison. Yeah. If you don't have hope in prison, then chaos is going to ensue. Exactly. But there's, you know, so there's deluding themselves to move ahead. But, you know. Most of the times, it, it doesn't serve you well. Well, yeah. I mean, we've talked about the Tory Lanez case before, the Tory Lanez of shooting Megan Thee Stallion case. You don't remember this? You told me about it, but I didn't know anything about it. Well, essentially, there was a drunken night, and Tory Lanez was dating, messing around with Megan Thee Stallion, but also she was messing around with her friend, and then a big argument ensued, and she ended up getting shot in the foot. Right? It went to trial, and he got 10 years. But what's interesting is that we just broke the story uh, yesterday was that we had a source that spoke to the DA's office and he got a four-year plea deal. He was offered four years before it went to trial mm -hmm. and he turned it down only to get 10 years. And even after the 10 years, he still is like, I'm innocent. There's an innocent black man, you know, being sent to prison. I didn't do anything, whatever else. All the evidence pointed to him doing it. The jury unanimously found him guilty on mm -hmm. all charges. There's a recorded phone call of him calling the other girl and apologizing, mm -hmm. you know, on a recorded phone call. And then when the trial started, his his defense tried to blame the shooting on her. So I'm like, okay, you mean to tell me you're apologizing to the shooter when you're sitting in jail? Like, okay, come on. Like, none of this stuff makes sense. But, I mean, it's always, it was interesting to me because it's like four years, you could do two and a half years, you'd be out relatively soon. Instead, you're doing 10 years. But, but people don't let go of the delusion. People, you know, and a lot of it I blame on social media because... Exactly. Whenever I've done a poll, all mm -hmm. of my audience say he's innocent. All mm -hmm. of my audience call her a liar. And it's like the amount of gassing up that was done was insane. Like everyone was thinking he's going to be found not guilty. Every, all the all the, the polls and everything else like that. And I knew a lawyer that I interviewed who was there. He, he had an interview set up for, you know, for us for when he was found not guilty and talk about the whole case. None of that shit happened. He was found guilty on all counts, and now he's in jail awaiting to be transferred to state penitentiary. Whatever you want to believe, you will then find that support group. Oh, yeah. That will tell you you're right. The echo chamber. Yeah, what I, like to I mean, call it. it's people, I mean, I, I never see anybody with the, any, any thriving from a, a, an ego that's re ready to be delusional. And once you get the 
desired result, you think that that's all the work that needs to be done. Yeah. My my philosophy is, and it worked for me, so hey, so be it. If you don't want to, do, I want to be proven wrong before I prove it right yeah. in every c- c- scenario. Yeah, you because always have they, to have people in your corner. Like you always, you know, this is why I always said almost every successful man I've ever known has either had a wife or a very serious partner in their corner. You rarely see men who are totally solo that are just going from female to female, uh, you know, that are consistently successful without stumbling Mm -hmm. seriously along the way. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And without getting any, you know, into any names, I mean, people I'm close to who are like that have stumbled really badly along the way, you know, but most people that I know that are married like you, Usually, you don't see them making just horrible decisions mm. because there's someone that's in their corner that are saying, that's stupid, don't do that. Mm-hmm. That they respect enough to listen to their opinion. When you're totally by yourself and there's no one else to listen to except for social media, yeah, you're going to do the dumbest shit because social media wants you to crash out. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but even if it's not even the person that's right next to you, not your, not your spouse or whatever, I mean... I mean, if I'm at a red light and somebody pulls up to me and say, you're an asshole, right? And if I immediately think about everywhere in the in the in life that I'm not an asshole, and I'm like, fuck you, gonna what what am I, what am I gonna to gain? And I'm like, what are you talking what, what do you what do you mean? You know, what like I'm like, well, why did you say that? Well, you cut me off back there. Oh shit. Well, I'm sorry. My bad. I didn't see that. Yeah. Maybe now I can learn something. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I didn't realize that. My bad. I'm gonna prove you wrong right before proving you wrong, so I can learn something. Yeah. Right? But that's the case when anything. Somebody tells me something, I'm gonna take it at, at face value. I'm not gonna defend myself first. Like, because hey man, every time I'm wrong, I learn something. Mm-hmm. And that served me really well. In having to debate things or whatever, because if you tell me your side and I can explain it back to you just as well as you can, I prove it to you. Now you shut the fuck up and listen to me because you know I got what you're saying. So if I prove to you, I know now you're going to be open to hear me. Right. So the thing is, I'm not going to do that because I already tried. I already tried to prove you right. That's why I can tell you it back. And I say there's something that you're not, not you know, gathering. So, I mean, personally, I've benefited from not having an ego. I love learning. You know, it's the same, same thing about what I talked about before. Me going to spar people. I want to get my ass beat so I can learn something. <laughs> it's not about I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I, I actually don't. I'm not happy about dominating somebody in a, in a fight. I'm actually upset. I mean, my wife could tell you. It's like, if I thought somebody was better mm. and I held them at another uh, certain standard, I'm, I'm kind of depressed, you know, because I, I wanted to be tested. Well, uh, according to Tupac's stepbrother, uh, Tupac was actually getting close to being cast into a, into a Star Wars movie franchise. I guess him and Samuel L. Jackson had a close friendship. Hmm. And and, uh, Samuel was trying to get him into Star Wars. And what I also heard, I remember Edie from the Outlaws told me this, was that Pac was originally cast in Will Smith's role in in, in, uh, Independence Day Hmm. when he passed. Do you see as someone, as a professional lifetime actor like yourself, do you feel that Pac was an exceptional actor? Yes. Really? Oh, absolutely. Exceptional. That's why people believe he's he's a gangster. <laughs> he's natural. I mean, I, I I say it's tantamount to Al Pacino staying. If Al Pacino stayed in the Scarface character, uh, he could have if he wanted to. Yeah. To impress, you know, uh, uh, what, what uh, uh, dr- drug lords from. <laughs> Mexico. From Cuba or whatever, <laughs> Cuba, yeah. he could have done that. Yeah, and I'm only speaking because I've hung with Tupac, mm-hmm. and my friends would t- or people would say, 
I swear your friend looks like Tupac. And they didn't think for a second it could have possibly been because he didn't speak the way that people expected and he didn't act the way people expected. He, he was a ball of energy bouncing off the wall um, closer. I mean, you just didn't, it's just, it was a whole different, he showed me a whole different side. But on screen, what you saw in the movies, Juice, Poetic Justice. He was a great, great actor. actor. You think he would have eventually, because, you know, this I was. I mean, like, I'm telling you, Loren Lorenz Tate could have done the same, like, could have been similar. Because Lorenz Tate could, I mean, it, it, he played O-Dog, right? If Lorenz Tate stayed in O-Dog, if Lorenz Tate was like, I, I like this character better than my own. Yeah. He could have been in that same situation yes, he because he Lorenz killed. is a badass actor too, uh -huh. and there's a lot of people like that. But Lorenz played a character and left it there. Well, because I remember I forgot which um, Chris Rock had a movie. I think it was called Top Five. Mm -hmm. And I remember they were talking about Tupac, and, and he was like, "Oh yeah, everyone would have said." You know that if Tupac had lived, he'd be this great major actor and stuff like he that. But you know, he also could have ended up as the abusive dark skinned boyfriend in a Tyler Perry film. No, Tupac, tu Tupac was a that natural acting ability. Again, I'm talking about it because I've hung with a guy who would could be silly as hell. He was mainly like very, like again, people didn't even think it could possibly be him. How you got a guy that looks exactly like him? But doesn't act like him. But people never thought it was. Huh. And so, so that just shows you there is two sides of it. And I, I know it's not like I'm making that shit up. It was for real. Because okay. I speak the way I speak, right? So it made him comfortable speaking the way he spoke. He didn't have to put up the gangster thing with me. You know what I mean? Because I wasn't acting like that. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, so he was really comfortable. That was... Be, that was kind of the reason, like a way that we kind of connected, you know. But, but that's just the, that's the truth of that, and that's a that's a lesson about human nature. It's the truth. Okay, so you're saying had Pac stuck with acting, because from what I heard, for example, from people around, I remember QD three even told me this because QD three, who's Quincy Jones' son, mm -hmm. uh, worked a lot with Pac on his last uh, album, the Machiavelli album, and he was saying how Pac was gonna actually give away the album as a free mixtape back before mm -hmm. this was a thing, mm -hmm. just so he could go full blown on acting. That he was basically done he, with the music he thing. Would he would have been one of the it. top actors. He yeah. would have, yeah. You know, because I remember like could, 3 was all upset because he was like, no, like this is most of, this is my payday. This is a major project. Mm -hmm. And he was really upset over it. But according to him and a couple other people, Pac was, there was way more money in Hollywood than in music. He had already gone to the top of the charts in music and he was gonna try to conquer Hollywood. Yeah. You know, and him and, um, I remember uh, him and John Singleton, he was saying how, who, who was it? I think um, Alan Hughes, I think, told me that he really loved John Singleton and he wanted to be like the, um, uh, like the De Niro Scorsese, Scorsese yeah. of black cinema, that essentially. Could, yeah, that could, he, he, that he, could he was turning happen. down, he turned down the lead role in Menace to Society because he had already committed to Singleton to be his lead role guy for mm -hmm. the rest of his films. Yes. And uh, so you think that had he stayed with it, he'd be winning Oscars and the such. I, 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 yeah, he, he would have okay. he he been- This is coming from a professional actor, not from yeah. me, from a professional lifelong actor like yourself. Because yeah, he, his natural ability was, I mean, that that's, that's God given. He, uh -huh. he, he was natural. And I know he knew those worlds. You know, as I, I call it bilingual, I know those worlds. I can, I was, I'm as comfortable in the hood, in the, in the, in the projects as I am in, in a freaking mansion. And so I, that's, I've been like that my entire life. So I know he was from that, but I think when you are from, you know, you were a dancer, you were doing all these different things. And now you got this amazing street cred and all these powerful people are praising you. That's intoxicating. That's been intoxicating for several people. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but again, like that, that, you could see that same thing happening to Drake. How so? 
if if Drake, I mean, imagine because Drake, imagine he plays a role. He was in Degrassi. Yeah, but but imagine he plays some kind of a real thug role, and it takes off. Yeah, it just takes off like crazy. Yeah, you know, people will be sitting there going, "Oh yeah, he's real." He's, you know what I mean? And and they, if if it became so important for people to see him as the new uh, persona. They would forget everything that about Degrassi. Yeah, I mean, it's, imagine, it's uh, interesting how the the, yeah. the minds work now. Right, right. I mean, you you forget that Drake the rapper was the wheelchair Jimmy in Degrassi, you know, in the the high school, you know, drama. Yeah, because because yeah. imagine, like, you think his fan base is thinking like, you know, what I mean, they 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 erased, well, I, they erased I, I, that. No, listen, I, I remember I was at Vlad TV was in Universal Records at the time. This was maybe 2010. And this was right when Drake was coming out. And I was talking to some of my coworkers mm. that were at Universal. And I'm like, what do you think of this Drake guy? I remember the guys around me were like, nah, because he he was he's from Degrassi and you know, actors, sure, rappers, that shit never works out. He played a corny character on that show. I don't, I don't think anyone's gonna buy it. Mm -hmm. And everyone bought it. <laughs> now he's the biggest rapper in the world. <laughs> everyone yeah, and, bought it. And, 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 they were all wrong. Hey, you know, there's a there's a big indication of all that. Okay, yeah, some people like say with Tupac and it's like, oh, he went to a high school performing arts. Oh, he's from from th this area. This is you know how he was. He was like, there's a guy named Trump that it's like he's the captain of the evangelicals. Evangelicals follow this guy, mm -hmm. where traditionally. A, a rich guy from New York, New York, yeah, who is who has been connected to with swindling people and all that. That's like the very opposite of what they've known to like. Mm -hmm. Go figure, right? So, I mean, it's like this: the if people want to believe something, they're not gonna let facts. Do it. <laughs> a reality, yeah. Yeah, it's like it's it's a whole new day. It's like hell with the facts. It's so important for That's me to believe news. this. Those facts are fake news. Yeah, it's so important for me to believe this. Don't don't you interrupt my delusion. Yes, you know. So I'm like, okay, you know, so be it. I mean, so be it. Yep. Yeah, um, David Carradine was a kung fu master. So is so is Seagal. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's important for you to believe that, so yeah, so be it, like, by all means. That's where we're going to end it. Michael Jai White, thank you for coming in again. Outlaw Johnny Black in theaters now. Go see it. Great in the hoods. Movement. Yes. Every hood. Every hood. Show up. It's there. It's yeah. showing. All right. Bring your girl, bring some popcorn, bring your kids. Yeah, bring your kids. It's actually kind of a family yeah, movie. You, yeah, the whole family you can, can bring. Go. You can bring your kids. Yep. yep. There you go. Yeah. It's a family movie with a good message at the end. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. you, brother. He said it, not me. I said it. Yeah, I right. said it. Till right. next time. Peace. Peace.